July of 1998, radio host Art Bell would receive a series of faxes from a man claiming to be a time traveler from the year 2036. Although this might seem ridiculous to most broadcasters, Art's show Coast to Coast AM built its massive fan base on stories of the mysterious and the paranormal. Aliens, ghosts, cryptids, no topic was off limits, and Art prided himself in providing a ridicule free platform for people with ideas on the fringes of society. So, of course, at his first chance, he read those faxes on the air. Dear Art, I had the fax when I heard other time travelers calling in from any time past the year 2500 AD. Please, let me explain. The faxes would go on to describe the man's personal experiences with time travel and make a number of dire predictions for the near future. They also provided contact information and a promise to send proof to Art. However, the proof was never sent, and the Time Traveler would disappear without another word. The Time Traveler was all but forgotten about until two years later when he would make another appearance, this time not through faxes, but on the internet. Now going by the name John Teeter, the Time Traveler would become the source of a mystery that would bridge the gap between the old media and the internet. A mystery that continues to capture people's imaginations to this very day. But was he really a Time Traveler? And if not, who was the man behind the curtain? Find out in this episode of Tales from the Internet. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. You've all heard of Raid Shadow Legends by now. The RPG with over 600 unique champions and hundreds of artifacts to let you develop your champions and raid your way. It's really easy to get into, and as you get more of an understanding of how the game works, there's a lot of hidden depth. Like putting together teams of champions whose skills complement each other and speed tuning their equipment so you can hit these abilities in the best order possible. One of my favorites is Sile of the Drakes, whose stun attacks and revives make her an asset in most of the game. And there's a ton happening in Raid this month. They're bringing out five badass looking new champions that I can't wait to get my hands on. They're overhauling the champion vault, and they've got a load of awesome smaller updates as well. On top of that, Raid's running a huge series of summer splash events for the whole month where you can get your hands on some incredible skins for everyone's favorite dwarf, Trunda. Oh, and one more thing. Make sure you get in now if you want to be a part of it. This is the best time to get started with Raid, and if you click the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen here, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Aina, 200k silver, 1 energy refill and 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in-game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. To get started, just go to the link in my description. The John Teeter mystery is probably the most requested topic for me to cover on this channel, and probably one of the most famous unsolved mysteries on the entire internet. It's a very dense, somewhat confusing tale with a number of players involved who may or may not be totally honest. Now all that being said, let's start from the beginning. The first fax by a time traveler would be sent to Art Bell in July of 1998, and it's important to note that at this time, Art would often receive calls from people claiming to be time travelers. In the fax, the time traveler claims to take issue with other callers who claim that they're coming from past the year 2500. According to the fax, whenever a time traveler goes past the year 2564, they hit an impassable brick wall. He goes on to describe how time travel works. Time travel was invented in 2034. Offshoots of certain successful fusion reactor research allowed scientists at CERN to produce the world's first contained singularity engine. The basic design involves rotating singularities inside a magnetic field. By altering the speed and direction of rotation, you can travel both forward and backward in time. Time itself can be understood in terms of connected lines. When you go back in time, you travel on your original timeline. When you turn your singularity engine off, a new timeline is created due to the fact that you and your time machine are now there. In other words, a new universe is created. He then goes on to make a number of predictions. 1. Y2K is a disaster. Oof, not really off to a good start. 2. The government tries to keep power by instituting martial law, but all of it collapses when their efforts to bring the power back up fail. 3. A power facility in Denver is able to restart itself, but is mobbed by hundreds of thousands of people and destroyed. This convinces most that maybe we shouldn't bring the old system back up. For a few years later, communal government system is developed after the constitution takes a few twists. China retakes Taiwan, Israel wins the largest battle for their life, and Russia is covered in nuclear snow from their collapsed reactors. 
Now, obviously, this whole series of events doesn't happen because Y2K just was not the disaster it was expected to be. But the true believers of the Time Traveler say that it didn't happen because he's the one who stopped it. Or there's also the chance that since he's from a different timeline from ours that it simply was never going to play out for us the way it played out for him. But really, these faxes were just an appetizer, something that was mostly forgotten about, along with all of the other time travelers who contacted Art Bell over the years. The ball really started getting rolling on November 2nd, 2000, when a user named Time Travel Zero posted to the Time Travel Institute forums. Greetings. I am a time traveler from the year 2036. I am on my way home after getting an IBM 5100 computer system from the year 1975. My time machine is a stationary mass temporal displacement unit manufactured by General Electric. The unit is powered by two topspin dual positive singularities that produce a standard offset Tipler sinusoid. I will be happy to post pictures of the unit. And in January, he would go on to make the same exact post to the Art Bell forums, now under the username John Teeter. He proceeded to post pictures of his time machine, which was installed in a 1967 Chevy Corvette. He also posted a picture of using the machine to bend a laser beam and of the machine's schematics. His explanation for how time travel works was also very much the same in that when you go back in time, you actually go to a separate world line. This means that although you can affect the future in the world you travel to, you're not affecting your own future. That means, for example, you can't accidentally erase yourself by cock-blocking your dad or anything like that. It's so if you can't change the future in any kind of way that'll actually affect you, why even bother? And the answer is to get stuff, like the 5100 computer. So now you have a time traveler posting on a forum, the logical thing is that people are going to ask him for all kinds of predictions. So people are asking him all the usual dumb things like lotto numbers and uh, sports trivia. Think about it for a second. Do you remember yesterday's lotto numbers or for that matter any set of lotto numbers that has ever existed except maybe the ones from Lost? Can you tell me, without looking it up, and be honest, who won the Stanley Cup 35 years ago? Probably not, so why would a time traveler? So, to avoid this type of continued annoyance, John laid out some rules. 1. I will not disclose any information that will cause someone to personally gain by its knowledge. This means no stock or sports tips. 2. I will not disclose any detailed information that would allow someone to avoid death by probability. This means no earthquake or bomb information. 3. I will not disclose any information that may compromise any future actions by individual people or threaten their family and well-being. I will not disclose names or events associated with individuals. And although these rules do seem kind of limiting, he actually did manage to make a lot of predictions. For instance, he said that the Olympics would end in 2004. I, I, I honestly wish that were true because I, I just don't get the appeal of the Olympics. Oh wow, this guy jumps into the water better than the other guy jumps into the water. You know, maybe I'd care if they were punching each other while doing it. But shockingly, in John's world, the Olympics weren't cancelled due to declining ratings. Rather, they were cancelled due to growing civil unrest. And it was that unrest that was the centerpiece of John's predictions. John described growing tensions between rural and urban populations, and people escaping from the cities to get away from government control. And I imagine that a lot of you hearing this and thinking about our current political landscape are thinking that doesn't sound too far-fetched. But it's when he starts going more into specifics that things start to fall apart. The year 2008 was a general date by which time everyone will realize the world they thought they were living in was over. The Civil War in the United States will start in 2004. I would describe it as having a Waco-type event every month that steadily gets worse. The conflict will consume everyone in the US by 2012 and end in 2015 with a very short World War III. And for those of you unfamiliar with Waco, it was an incident in which the ATF and the FBI raided a compound owned by the Branch Davidians, a doomsday cult. The raid occurred because they were believed to be stockpiling illegal weapons, and it culminated in a 51-day firefight between hundreds of people, leaving 86 dead. Outright open fighting was common by then, and I joined the Shotgun Infantry Unit in 2011. I joined with the Fighting Diamondbacks for about four years. Hearing in my right ear isn't as good as I would like it. The Civil War ended in 2015 when Russia attacked the US cities, our enemy, China, and Europe. 
As unusual and bad as my childhood might seem, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And the reason why World War III was so short was because it was an all-out nuclear conflict. Basically, they hit the reset button Fallout style. And now, although the state of domestic and international politics leaves a bit to be desired these days, I don't seem to recall shotgun militias of child soldiers roaming the streets. I don't recall monthly pitched battles between hundreds of people, and I don't remember everything getting nuked three years ago. But you know, I was playing a lot of COD back then, so I might have just missed it. But missed predictions aside, there were a couple things that he said that did gain him a lot of credibility. For instance, there were people who said that his description of using singularities conflicted with our knowledge of physics at the time. But then in 2004, Stephen Hawking published a paper revising his theories and making them fall more in line with what John Teeter said. Additionally, Teeter claimed that the reason he was looking for the IBM 5100 computer was that it had an unpublicized secret feature that he needed in the future. He needed this feature in the year 2036 to deal with a Y2K-like bug with Unix systems in 2038, and this is a real bug that is known about. And it was later confirmed by Bob Dubkey, who is one of the developers of the 5100 computer, that the secret feature John Teeter spoke of was in fact a real feature. And now there are people that claim that this secret feature of the 5100 wasn't as secret as it was made out to be, but at the very least, if this was a hoax, it would require someone to be in the IT industry to know about this. And it was pretty evenly split. There were a lot of people who believed in John Teeter, and there were a lot of people who thought he was full of shit. Either way, it would be on March 24th of 2001 that John Teeter would make his last post. I will be leaving this world line shortly, and this will be my final post. There are only a handful of people who will know exactly when I will be leaving, and I'm sure they will let you know when I'm gone. In the last few days, I have found your choice of topics quite interesting, and from an objective viewpoint, I think it collectively answers one of your own questions. If time travel is real, where are all the time travelers? In the past, I have stated that quite frankly, you all scare the hell out of me and I'm sure other temporal drivers would feel the same. But now I have an expanded explanation with two examples. A while ago, on one of the posts, I related an experience I had with my parents while we were driving down a highway. Every now and then, we would pass someone who was in obvious distress with their vehicle. I was amazed that so many people could pass them by without stopping to help. Their explanation was fear. The risk of helping someone was too great and with today's technology, they probably had a cell phone anyway. If they didn't, the walk to the gas station would be good for them and teach them a lesson for running out of gas. The other example is the plight of the homeless. When you pass them as individuals on the street, I see the way people selectively choose an alternate path to avoid them. Those two examples best define why time travelers do not show themselves. In trying to help you, we put ourselves at great risk and there's really no point to it. We know the nature of time dictates that traveling between exact world lines is impossible. Therefore, the only results we will see will be the ones we stay to see. Since world lines, outcomes, and events are infinite, we have better things to do. When I arrive in the new 1998 world line on my way home, I could easily start all of this again and continue to go through the same conversations with all the same people. However, I know you won't pay any attention or believe me because we've already been through it on this world line. Besides, I think the walk to the gas station will do you some good. I also want to thank Pamela for helping me with the email and everyone else who asked intelligent and insightful questions. I've learned a great deal. My parting thought revolves around something JC has been harping on since day one. No, I do not have a secret agenda, but I have been paying a great deal of attention to your world line. My interaction with you was not a direct mission parameter, but it was a secondary mission protocol based on standing orders given to all temporal drivers. That secondary objective is basically to gather as much information about a world line based on a set of observable variables when we first arrive. Your world line met those conditions. What amazes me is why no one here wonders why Y2K didn't hit them at all. Bring a gas can with you when the car dies on the side of the road. Farewell, John. John Teeter, at least the one who was posting on the Art Bell forums, was gone. But his story was far from over. For the next several years, to this very day, the John Teeter story has accumulated a laundry list of potential collaborators, suspects, and cohorts. Let's take a look at some of them. You might have noticed that John mentioned a woman named Pamela. 
Pamela was a forum user who developed a close personal relationship with John, and reportedly they communicated a lot in private. John famously gave Pamela a secret song as a code. If he ever came back to this world line, he would tell her the song and she would know it's him. This has not yet happened. However, in 2017, Pamela contacted a man named Michael Sov, the writer of a book entitled, Who Authored the John Teeter Legend? She sent him the picture of an IBM 5110 label that John sent her. Remember though that John Teeter got a 5100 and not a 5110, so I don't know why he would send her that. She also says that before he came, she saw him in a dream. Everyone thinks I started out asking John too many detailed questions when he came in 2000. But the truth was, I had a detailed dream of a time traveler in 1998. I didn't know exactly when I had the dream when I started talking to John in the beginning, but I remembered that dream. The questions I was asking him and his answers are what I saw in the dream, so I kept asking detailed questions. By then, I was intrigued by him. In my dream, I was in a car time traveling with a man where what he described exactly matched my dream. Later, before he left, he said he had to stop in April of 1998. I went and grabbed my notebook, and at the top was the date, April 1998. My mouth dropped, then I told John about my dream. And because of her relationship with John Teeter, there's a lot of people who believe that Pamela is the key to understanding everything. However, there's also people who think she was just being trolled, or maybe she's just an attention whore. There's also the case of a man named Marlon Pullman. Marlon Pullman was a highly educated computer scientist who worked in software development and published a number of books on the topic. In other words, he was the kind of guy who would know exactly about the kinds of things that John Teeter spoke of. And in 2004, he went and tried to patent John Teeter's time machine. This of course caused a lot of people to think that Marlon Pullman was actually the man behind the posts. Marlon denied these claims, however, and said that this was simply a project he did to keep himself occupied while he was dealing with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2002. In his own words, I had nothing better to do. I think I made a mathematical error. He looked at the schematics that John Teeter posted and he tried to reverse engineer the ideas based on the things that he said in his posts. And although Marlon has overcome the Hodgkin's lymphoma, his story took an unexpected turn in 2013 when he was convicted to six years in prison after pleading guilty to assault and drug possession charges. There's also the case of Oliver Williams. In the summer of 2001, a few months after John Teeter left, Art Bell's forums closed due to clashes between the moderators and the users. The legend of John Teeter might have been completely lost were it not for the efforts of Oliver Williams. He went on to create JohnTeeter.com, which collected all of the forum posts in one place, as well as any news stories related to them. His website quickly became the central hub for all things John Teeter related, and really was what got the popularity of the story into the mainstream. Because of this, there are some people who think that Oliver Williams was really the guy behind John Teeter and just wanted to preserve his own story. In general, though, I think most simply view him as a John Teeter enthusiast who is concerned with preserving the lore. What did raise a few eyebrows, however, was when he added a merch store in 2004 and included a book by the John Teeter Foundation. When asked about this book, Oliver provided this update. Do you know anything about the John Teeter book and or the rights to use the story? As you may know, a book has appeared on Amazon.com that compiles all of John Teeter's posts and pictures. It also has comments from John's mom in our time about what he wrote. I've also seen the book appear on eBay and it claims to have another picture from the time machine. I did get an email from an eBay buyer stating the book was signed by John's mom. They described the extra picture as a regular piece of paper folded inside the book. Apparently it has more technical details about the time machine. From everything I've seen from people who own the book, it's pretty good and gives you a different feel for the story. I understand that the John Teeter book has representation through an attorney named Larry Haber. I'm no legal expert, but the attorney seems adamant that the author has the copyright to the John Teeter story. So far, we have not had any requests to remove the content from our site. And it's with this update that Larry Haber, who many people believe to be one of the key players, enters this story. Larry Haber is an entertainment lawyer who has worked for Disney and was based out of Celebration, Florida, a town created by Disney. 
In fact, according to the Orlando Sentinel, Larry and his family were actually the very first people to live in Celebration, Florida. By the time of John Teeter's posting, Celebration, Florida only had a population of 2,736 people. Here's a fun fact about John Teeter. When he posted on the Art Bell forums and on the Time Travel Institute forums, his IP address was known. This IP address was not linked to Tampa, Florida, where he claimed to be from. Rather, that IP address was 66.8 miles away, a one-hour drive in the small town of Celebration, Florida. With Larry Haber being the sole name connected to this new mysterious John Teeter Foundation, and with the Celebration, Florida connection, he became the primary suspect to be behind John Teeter. Whenever asked about it though, Larry claims that he was simply hired by John Teeter's mother, Kay Teeter. Meanwhile, an investigator named John Rasmus has been leading the hunt for John Teeter for over 12 years and is one of the main people who spearheaded the investigation into Larry. And it was on February 13th of 2009 that John published his findings on a blog entitled The Rasmus Report. Rasmus begins by listing 88 names of forum users that he believes were fake accounts created by John Teeter to help sell the story. Essentially, these accounts were only active while John Teeter was active and gave him questions that might help him build the story that he wanted to build. As soon as John was gone, so were they. He goes on to name other potential suspects such as forum moderators and usual posters and rules them out. And he concludes the story by naming some suspects that he can't rule out, such as Oliver Williams who he nicknames For Sale Oliver due to the Cafe Press store, and Larry Haber. And as suspicions around Larry Haber grew, people began to investigate not just Larry, but his family as well. It was Mike Lynch, a private investigator hired by an Italian TV show named Voyager that started to point not to Larry, but to Richard Haber, Larry's brother who is an IT technician. Larry, as a lawyer, might not have had the technical knowledge to talk about the 5100 the way that John Teeter did, but Richard might have. And as suspicions around the Haber family grew and people kept on asking them about it, they wound up doing an interview with a YouTube channel called Where Is John Teeter? I'm Larry Haber, uh, attorney for the John Teeter Foundation. This is my son Brandon and my brother Richard who lives uh, up in New York and is visiting us uh, this week. No they one not here is John Teeter. Although they mostly just denied the claims, there were a few interesting nuggets to come out of this interview, in particular, Larry mentioning a farewell video. There is a departure video. Uh, I can't talk much more about it. I know that they also want to release that to, to make sure people understood, understand that this is real and that John was here. I've seen it once. It looks real to me. I don't know anything more about it. Again, How long is the video? How long's the departure video? Yeah. A couple of minutes is all I saw. I don't even know if it's longer than that. I saw two minutes of it. Man, shit? No. And as John Rasmus continued his investigation, he began to look not just at Larry Haber and Richard Haber, but also at their other brother, Maury Haber. Maury Haber is another IT industry vet who maintains a blog about IT-related topics. By comparing the speech patterns of Maury Haber's blog posts to John Teeter's forum posts, John Rasmus has concluded that Maury Haber was in fact the man behind John Teeter. So that's it. Maury Haber is John Teeter then, right? Well, actually, it might be more complicated than that. You see, while most of the people who've come up in this story have denied being John Teeter, there's actually someone who not only claims to be John Teeter, but is actually insulted that nobody else thought it might be him. Let's take a trip back to the 1980s. It was at this time that a work of collaborative fiction known as Ong's Hat was made. Considered by many people to be the very first ARG or alternate reality game in history, Ong's Hat had components that were both online and in the real world. This game told the story of a device called the Egg, which would allow a person to travel between dimensions. Not too unlike what John Teeter was describing. This work was created by a Netscape employee named Joseph Matheny, and he concluded it in 2001. According to Joseph, he started to become frustrated with Ong's Hat in the late 90s when it started to attract less people who were interested in the game and the fiction, 
and more people who were legitimate conspiracy theorists who thought it was real. He thought that these people were annoying and humorless and that they were ruining his game, and he came to dislike them intensely. So he began thinking of a project to troll these people, and according to Joseph, that's when John Teeter was born. But it wasn't just him that was John Teeter. According to Joseph Matheny, there were actually three other collaborators that he had. So you you were John Teeter. You were the you were the guy. Well, that I was I was one of the John Teeters. <laughs> yeah, see, I okay. knew there was more involved than just one. I think the you're yeah, yeah. What was going on? It could have only been more than one. <laughs> yeah, there, there was actually four of us. Me counting. Yeah. Uh, counting me. Yeah, there was four of us. He also claimed that the Haber family had absolutely no connection to the story, and he contacted them after the book was published. I don't know if I want to go into it, but basically, I put it out of print. Okay. Um, go ahead, yeah. And, go ahead. I, and I and I did it by contacting the guy who was publishing it and telling him in no uncertain terms. Um, you know who you're talking to right now? You're talking to John Peter, motherfucker. Um, you need to stop selling this book, or I'm going to go public with what a fucking fraud you are. And I'm going to tell people, even if I have to out myself to do it, I'm going to tell people, you know, that you are a chiseling, lying entertainment attorney, and you should go over a cliff on a bus. And if you look, the book did get taken out of publication very quickly, and a used copy can now fetch hundreds of dollars. So if what Joseph Matheny is saying is true, here's a potential sequence of events. Joseph Matheny and his cohorts developed the John Teeter mythos in 1998. The faxes happen as kind of a dry run, they sit on it for two more years, and then he appears on the forums. The forum posts happen to gain a lot of steam, then in March of 2011 they pull the plug on it. The John Teeter thing mostly gets forgotten about for two more years until 2003 when Oliver Williams makes his website. This website is created in June of 2003 and it's where the story really begins to hit its peak of popularity. Seeing that popularity, Larry Haber decides to create the John Teeter Foundation in September of 2003 and do what he can to cash in on it. This is probably the most logical sequence of events if Joseph Matheny is to be believed. But I'm not so sure he is. That's because sometimes the things Joseph Matheny says about John Teeter conflict with other things he said about it. Take this contradiction from a Thrillist interview he did. None of us were paying attention or curating this after a point. Sometime in 2000 is when we stopped doing it. So if they were done with it in 2000, that would eliminate all of the Art Bell forum posts. It wouldn't eliminate the Time Travel Institute posts, except for the fact that it had the same IP address as the Art Bell posts. So if what he said in the Thrillist interview is true, that means that he's responsible for only the faxes and no forum posts. Of course, there's always the chance that he just misspoke or misremembered the dates, so you know, you can't be 100% about that either. What actually might be the most definitive piece of evidence so far is something that only came up very, very recently. Although some people were convinced it was Maury Haber by Rasmus' analysis of his speech patterns, some people criticized it saying that it wasn't that scientific. So it was in August of 2018 that Michael Saab decided to take this line of investigation a step further. To do this, Michael enlisted the help of Andrea Nini, a forensic linguist who has investigated the Jack the Ripper letters in the past. And Andrea also brought his postgrad students to help him with this investigation. Their findings? First off, there's no way that John Teeter was a real time traveler. This is due to certain elements of his writing style, in particular how he says website. In his posts, he writes website as two words, said Nini. One thing we know about English is that new word compounds of this type usually take the same path to become lexicalized into one word. Usually there's a cycle. Students looked at a collection of words called a corpus of English that include historical data, and you can clearly see that website behaves as it should. You can see it behaves like all the other compounds. Back at the time John Teeter was writing, it was spelled as two words and that variant basically died. And now it's just one word. It would definitely disappear in the future. And they also provided a graph showing the declining use of website as two words. Additionally, Michael provided Andrea with a list of potential suspects. This list included Joseph Matheny, Oliver Williams, and Maury Haber. Writing samples were taken from these men and compared to John Teeter's forum posts. After analyzing all the data, Andrea and his postgrad students concluded that the most likely suspect 
was Maury Haber. However, Andrea did give the caveat that this only analyzes who the most likely suspect from the pool of suspects is. If the person behind John Teeter's posts wasn't in the pool of suspects, then this doesn't bring us any further to the truth. So essentially, this isn't saying that Maury Haber was definitely John Teeter. What it's saying is that out of these suspects, he's the most likely one. So what do you think? Is Maury Haber John Teeter? Is Joseph Matheny John Teeter? Is it someone else? Or was John Teeter really a time traveler? Moving to a new place is generally pretty expensive, but you got lucky. You see, you got a great deal on an old abandoned trap house. So you get settled in your new digs, check out the graffiti on the wall, and all of a sudden you notice something. A massive locked vault. What could possibly be locked away in a safe in an old gang hideout? Money, drugs, dead bodies. I know this is all sounding very familiar, but don't worry, Oprah does not get involved this time. And this time, there actually is something in that safe. So on this episode of Tales from the Internet, I want to talk about the original locked Reddit vault. Reddit is home to countless boxes, vaults, and safes whose contents are unknown. So much so, there's now a subreddit called r slash what's this thing. And actually, the story I'm about to tell you is why this subreddit was created in the first place. It begins with a post on March 13th of 2013 by a user named Don't Stop Me Smee. A friend of mine moved into a former drug house and found this huge safe. How do we get it open? And he linked to an imager album. Garage door. My friend just moved into a former gang house. Upstairs looks pretty normal, but the garage under the house has heavy bars on all the windows and a thick steel door. The safe. Notice the power supply leading into it at the top. The handle looks like it's been ground off. Closer shot of the dial. Surely, the tape has something to do with the combination? Is there any way I can get into this thing? I like how this house came complete with its own Resident Evil style puzzle. Side shot of the vault. This thing is pretty big, and there are some thick girders running through it. I've already asked, and I'm not allowed to jackhammer it. Front. I need to know what's in this vault. Safe crackers get at me. Commenters immediately had flashbacks to the last big Reddit mystery extravaganza. Oh god, it's happening again. No one call Oprah and we should be fine. And some other concerns were also brought up. For example, what if the gang members who previously occupied this house came back to get the contents of their safe, but they found it empty? They'd surely take it out on poor Don't Stop Me Smee. Can you imagine for a second thousands of Redditors coming together to egg on another Redditor to do something that leads to him getting wasted in a gangland shooting? Then there's the issue of who actually owns the contents of the safe. You see, the guy who moved into that house was only renting it, so technically the contents of that safe might belong to the landlord. If they found anything good in there, he could easily turn around and say, hey, you're stealing my shit. Either way, Reddit quickly got to work, and a user named NetDigger identified the lock on the safe very quickly as being one of the 6600 or 6700 type locks from Sargent and Greenleaf. And according to their site, they did not possess the combinations to any of their locks. So contacting them would be to no avail. Additionally, it was supposed to take two full hours for an expert to crack this lock. But that wouldn't stop Reddit from doling out advice. First of all, please don't take any kind of torch to it. It is a Sergeant and Greenleaf dial 6630, I believe. What will most likely have to happen is it might be able to be dialed open using a special stethoscope. If that doesn't work, then if you have access to a boroscope, then you can look up the drill placement for the dial ring and you can drill through and see where the glasses line up so the fence can drop in and the door can be opened. You have to be very, very careful not to drill through the back plate of the lock because you'll punch the back cover off and trigger the relocker and then it becomes a huge problem. If you could send me a closer pick of the dial and any writing on the door, I should be able to get you some more information. Yeah, that sounds really simple. I'm sure this guy was going to get right on that. There are also some much simpler suggestions, for example, getting a professional locksmith to do it. A suggestion that Smee was at first into, but gradually began to ignore. Ultimately, Don't Stop Me Smee would create an entire new subreddit specifically for this mystery. Oh, I know Reddit's history with safes and hard drives, etc. If somebody comes up with a useful way to get into this thing, I'll try it tomorrow and post pics. 
fuck it, I'll even start a subreddit for it if you're still not convinced. r slash what's in this thing. Although specifically created for this one mystery, the subreddit would quickly become a hub for all things mystery boxes and safes. Tens of thousands of people joined right away. And within three days of the subreddit's creation on March 19th, a redditor named Safe is Big found another mystery safe. And after hiring a locksmith, it turned out that Safe is Big did have something in his safe. Binders filled with old magic cards. Another redditor, Jubilation Lee, went through the trouble of putting together a spreadsheet with the values of every single card in this collection. By her calculations, it was worth as much as $32,000. The next day, the whole thing was exposed as a hoax. The original debunking post is now deleted and not archived, but essentially what it entailed was going to the YouTube channel that the video of the safe opening was uploaded to. The username attached to the channel was then connected to another Reddit account, which was connected to an OkCupid account, which was then connected to forum accounts. And ultimately, these forum posts led all the way back to a post in 2010. And in 2010, this person had posted the exact same collection. This new subreddit is not off to a good start, but Don't Stop Me Smee was determined to get to the bottom of this mystery, and that was in spite of the fact that a few people pointed out that it was likely that this safe, even if it had contents at some point, was emptied out between tenants. Since this was a well-known gang-slash-drug house, police would have known about it and at some point have seen the safe, gotten inside of it, emptied it out, and left. So if there is ever something interesting in there, money, drugs, a body, it's probably gone now. Because of that, some people suggested that Smee just, you know, plant something nice in there to satisfy Reddit. Just a little bit of a fake out, you know, like, when you're a kid and your mother buys you Mario 2 and says, Oh, your dad sent it, even though, you know, he didn't really send it to you, she's just, you know, making stuff up. But you play along with it because an effort was made. That's what they were suggesting. And there are also some actual reasonable suggestions from people who had experience working with locks. Things like default codes that that type of lock might have had. Oh yeah, and he also bought an endoscope, which I thought an endoscope was just something that goes up your butt, but apparently that can go up any hole you would like to explore. He then announced his intentions to stream his attempts on the now defunct Justin.tv. And this move made a lot of people theorize that perhaps this guy was some kind of a scammer. Maybe he was building up publicity for something, maybe he was just trying to become e-famous off of this. But despite those concerns, the streams drew a couple thousand people. The VODs of these streams are long gone, but the reviews from those days do not look so hot. It's like 10 minutes of him recording himself typing on the computer, then another 10 minutes of him complaining he doesn't have enough cable. Did he really think that hole for conduit was going to be big enough for him to put anything through it into the vault? Then he tries putting the endoscope into the keyhole? Then he says they're going to try drilling a hole later after he has consistently said there could be no drilling whatsoever? Don't drill the fucking door, idiot! Drill the sides if you're going to drill. Now he wants to trigger the locker panel on purpose. Sigh. What an idiot. There was also growing suspicion over him refusing to hire a locksmith. It almost made it seem like he either had something to hide or he was trying to stretch this out for as long as possible. And these suspicions would come to a head after somebody dug up a post that he had made four months prior to the original post. Answering a question on Ask Reddit, in Reddit's history, what has been the seemingly best post that has ended up being exposed as bullshit? Don't stop me, Smee. Perhaps the safe story was the oldest one I read while lurking. I can't remember enough about it to search for a link though. Sorry guys, smiley face. Edit, there is also a similar one about a hidden hard drive. This discovery was posted to r slash what's this thing and then... I think it's pitchfork time. A post would be made on r slash karma court, prosecuting don't stop me smee for his crimes against the sanctity of reddit karma. Basically, the consensus had become that this guy was full of shit, and this was when he would give his most detailed account of what had happened. Ladies and gentlemen of the distinguished karma court, I humbly thank you for your time and patience. My New Zealand time zone means that much of the world is offline by the time I wake up or finish work, and usually I try to wait till 3am to post something so it is visible. Please allow me to apologize for the delay in replying. 
old PMs to me are currently being buried, and I'm trolling back through my inbox right now, trying to weed out the useful information. It has been a complete nightmare for me over the last few weeks, pushing my account to an almost unusable state. I am receiving a mountain of messages and comment replies on an hourly basis, and as a relative newbie to Reddit, I find this extremely distressing and intimidating. As a former message board moderator, I am used to writing long replies then logging off, and my private messages are usually non-existent. Let's get to the safe. This was an idea I had after a long, boozy night staring at the vault door in my friend's basement. I slung my camera over my shoulder and told him I thought r slash lockpicking could probably help out. I admit I posted the album to r slash picks in the hope of getting maximum exposure, but at that point, and still, I had no idea how karma or fuzzing worked, and thought that 2000 karma only meant 2000 people. When over 20,000 started bombarding the subreddit within hours, I really started panicking, and I was lucky to have a great moderator team step in to save me in the early hours. The whole point of the subreddit was supposed to be somewhere I could collect all the tips I was getting from people on the thread. They were coming through too fast for me to read them and save them, and I thought it would be a great idea. Unfortunately, I had never set one up before or even talked to someone that had so I had no clue about what rules to set up or even how to edit the sidebar. As a result, the first 48 hours were a disaster. With some careful modding, the team has managed to prune the submissions down to safe related stuff, but we are still under constant abuse. On the issue of verification, I have live streamed several times from the vault and every time it has caused more trouble. The people that missed the live stream accused me of not doing one, and the people that see it complain that I didn't open the vault and that I'm just wasting time slash creating hype? I do not want hype. It is the last thing I need. Every step of the way, I have stressed that I expect this to be a project which will take time and effort, and not just a one hour make Reddit happy venture. Now, I implore the court. What can I do? The hate mail and messages are getting me down, and yes, I did consider disappearing for a while. I have scaled back my account's activity drastically, which breaks my heart as I love this place. But one thing I have learned is not to feed the trolls. My friends and I are not very internet-y people. I use my Facebook like an email box and report all games and apps I see as spam. I hate cat pictures and funny YouTube videos from 11 year olds with helium voices, and I enjoy animated discussions with chatters in the JTV sidebar and seeing my torrents at appropriate hours of the night. Please help me. Any advice you can give me would be hugely appreciated. Yeah, yeah, open the fucking safe, I know. As of 1pm NZ time, 9pm EDT, thank you for your time. Sincerely, DSMS. He also explained his hesitation to contact the locksmith. It's not really my identity that I want kept quiet. It's the fact that if anything's in there, the cops get cold. If he's an honest safecracker. And it might get tricky to prove that we didn't in fact put it in there in the first place. Bear in mind, although my friend rents the place, and in our mind we reckon the safe should be counted as a stuck cupboard that needs opening. Very loose definition, of course, and it's tricky to explain to locksmiths who actually owns it. Consider this. Hi, Mr. Actual Accredited Safe Expert. I'm a random guy who doesn't want to show ID, and I don't need to get into a huge vault in a house that isn't mine. No, we didn't lose the combo. We found it like that. No, the safe isn't ours. Oh, we can pay you. I have a huge anonymous fund of digital money given to me by hundreds of anonymous people on the internet. Ultimately, r slash karma court founds him innocent of all charges. From this point on, he would leave a couple more updates about the safe, although significantly more sporadic. But things came to a bit of a head when he drunkenly made a now deleted post on r slash self. The post was entitled... R.I.P. Grandma, say hi to Poppy for me. Although the body of the post is now deleted and not archived, I think we can use context clues to figure out what it's about. Most of the people in the thread were consoling him and condemning the people who were giving him an extra hard time about the safe. However, there's one now deleted, heavily downvoted post that he replied to with his thoughts on the entire situation. Fuck that stupid safe, I wish I never found it. I want my fucking Reddit account back. The rest of the internet is shit. I just wanted to talk to somebody. 
frowny face with a tear. He would make a couple more update posts about the safe before disappearing entirely. Months passed, and not a single word was heard about it from him. But then, on December 23rd of 2013, months after the original discovery of the safe, a new post was made on r slash pics. Not by Don't Stop Me Smee, but by another user, Mantis NZL. The safe. Some people doubted our resolve, but I said it would be open by New Year's. Attached was an image realm that showed the vault being opened. Can't wait to see what's inside. A big spooky spider. At least it's better than Oprah's leftover pennies. And as it turned out, this guy had no actual connection to OP. He was just the guy that happened to rent the house next. He found the safe in the basement and he was like, wait a second. He put the pieces together and it's like, oh shit. That's the Reddit safe. It was a letdown. I was hoping for a dead body or some sort of mob stash. Instead, it's just a whole lot of spiders and the shattered hopes and dreams of thousands of Redditors, myself included. I'll check it over more thoroughly after a few beers. Earned them after that. Is anyone able to date this? Why it took you so long to find an angle grinder and a fucking crowbar? I'm not the original guy who posted it. I'm the new guy that moved into the house and just realized that this was a thing three weeks ago. As for Don't Stop Me Smee, he returned to this thread for the festivities. Fuck yeah! Does this mean I get to have my account back now? Oh my god, it's original OP, get him! He didn't stick around to this long, but to this day, his creation, r slash what's this thing, remains Reddit's hub for all sealed mysterious objects. But anyway, that's it for the story of the Reddit mystery vault. If you were asked which YouTuber you thought was the most wholesome, purest person on this entire godforsaken platform, who would it be? Alright, you're not stupid, obviously you saw the title and the thumbnail, so you know that this video is about review bra. But I suspect that there's a good chance that even if you didn't know that, you might still choose him. And of course, one of the most immutable laws on the internet is that if there's something pure, someone will try to destroy it. And with that in mind, I bring you the tale of Review Bra's Stalker. I'm gonna play you a clip of the Report of the Week's review of Taco Bell's Spicy Triple Double Crunch Wrap. Pay very close attention to this clip because I want to see if you notice anything unusual. Alright, as for the jalapenos, they're there. Um, but they don't really, they, they more or more or less blend in with everything else. Um, you can taste, again, a little bit of spiciness from them. If you didn't see it, don't worry, because neither did the vast majority of the people watching this video when it came out on July 28th of 2016. But people started to play closer attention after he left this comment. I was gang stalked the entire time I filmed this review. I tried to pay the perps no heed, but it was quite scary. And although the overwhelming response to this comment was support from his fans, there were some people who doubted him. A small minority of people actually thought that he was faking it to drum up drama for views. I smelled a fish on this one too. YouTube channels need drama to increase their subscribers. The whole thing smelled fishy from long ago. This wasn't a very popular theory and people thinking it were quickly shouted down because obviously this is just not his style. There was, however, a larger minority of people who began to become concerned about Review Bra's mental health. And a big part of that wasn't just that he said he was stalked, he said he was being gang stalked. The thing about gang stalking is it's very often reported by people who are suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. People who say that they're being gang stalked often report that they're being followed by vans, 
helicopters. They're being surreptitiously recorded by their own devices, uh, TVs, phones, and whatnot. They think their homes are bugged. They think there's actors following them around trying to lure them into a false sense of security. All of this as a part of some larger conspiracy to get at them for some reason. For an example of what I'm talking about, here are some examples of gang stalking victims describing what they're going through. Police vehicles driving slowly along the street, but they never uh, came up to me or said anything. And then I had seven or eight helicopters hovering directly over my apartment. Here it comes. I get it to see if, I don't know if you can hear that on the audio, but we're getting a buzz right now. You know, heterosexual couples um, would hold hands and like stroll through the back of the parking lot like they were on some 1950s sitcom. People that are trying to look incredibly normal look incredibly abnormal because they're, they're acting. Keep these people's stories in mind now when listening to what Review Bra had to say the next day. You know, what happened, uh, if you look in the review, the last review, the Taco Bell one, around 6 minutes and uh, 36 seconds in, you'll see this green van drive through the, uh, through the shot. You remember that clip that I showed you at the beginning of the video, right? Let's take another look at it. They more or more or less blend in with everything else. Um, you can taste again. So we see the van that he's talking about, but then he goes on to explain the part that we didn't see. And this green van was following me around all day long. And I thought, you know, well, okay, perhaps it's just a local resident. Perhaps they're going to the same place as I'm going, right? No big deal. But what, what really got me was... During the course of this review, this green van drives through the shot, pulls perpendicular to me, had two passengers, uh, the driver and the passenger in it, and the passenger side window, while I'm filming, rolls down, and the passenger suddenly gets a camera and starts filming me continuously while I'm just sitting here minding my business, and then as soon as I stopped filming and looked at them, they rolled up the window and got out of there. And you might hear his story and think, oh shit, he's talking about Vance following him and being recorded just like the people in the Vice story. But I think there's a distinction to be made. It's important to note that in Review Bra's story that he's not talking about any greater conspiracy to get him. He's not talking about a pattern of events or things happening to him. In this case, he's only talking about this one specific incident of a van following him around with a bunch of people in it and recording him, which is honestly something that's very likely to happen to a big YouTuber. If I had to guess, I would say that he probably simply misused the word gang stalking. He might have thought that it simply referred to being stalked by multiple people. And also it does kind of sound like an old timey word a little bit, which is his aesthetic. So with that in mind, I think a lot of the speculation about his mental health was mostly fueled by misunderstandings and miscommunications. And it would be cool if that's where the story ended, but it's not. You see, at this point, he had made one of the cardinal mistakes that you always want to avoid doing on the internet. He appeared vulnerable. And when you appear vulnerable on the internet, especially when you have a big platform, someone's going to try to take advantage of that. And that's exactly what happened on July 30th, a day after this video was released, when a person made this post on poll. Anyone want some rare review bras I stole from his house last night? Also, my van was featured in one of his latest videos. Topcak, this kid is paranoid as fuck now. Also, I know his entire night walk route he takes. Paul was one place he shouldn't have visited. The red bill comes with side effects. This person would go on to post pictures of Review Bra with his family. He claimed that he knew the times that he goes out for walks and that he does his walks while wearing his suits. And at some point he was saying that he was outside Review Bra's home waiting trying to get him to eat some brownies. And while some people were curious about this situation, a lot of people just told the guy to fuck off. With Review Bra being as well liked as he is, a lot of people didn't really take kindly to some random guy fucking with him like this. And others were quick to note that some of the photos he posted were already available online through family members' Facebooks and things like that. And also, it showed that the guy was posting from Korea, which you might be surprised to find out Review Broad does not live in Korea. So yeah, it's very likely that that poll user was using a VPN or a proxy to make it look like they were somewhere that they weren't, but at the same time, I still think he was full of shit. In all likelihood, he was just taking advantage of a publicly 
known situation using publicly available information to have a laugh at Review Bra's expense. But Review Bra wasn't laughing. And on the 12th of August, Keen observers noticed something a little concerning in the background of one of his videos. Is that a mattress? Do you live out of your car? I think that's a mattress in the back there. As of now, I am living out of the car. Guys, he got kicked out of his house. Look, there's a bed in the back. I still have good relations with my folks. I just have to keep moving. I just have to keep moving. And that quote will become a meme that he was not happy about at the time. This was concerning to a lot of his fans, and he would go on to clarify on Reddit. Living out of his car? In the comments of the Taco Bell Crunchy Cheesy Core Burrito review, a commenter mentions the mattress in the back of Review Bra's car. Review Bra replies saying, as of now, I am living out of my car. Is this just his classic brand of sarcasm? Does this have to do with his road travels? Has he been kicked out? I have so many questions, hopefully they will be cleared up in the next VORW. There is an idiot impersonator that posted earlier, pay him no mind. I am living out of the car at the moment. I haven't been kicked out and family relations are great. I don't want to share too many details at this moment, just know that things are okay. If I had to guess, I would think that perhaps he was living out of his car during this time as a way to protect his family from whatever was going on at the time. Although it's likely that the guys in the van were perhaps just fans and the 4chan post was most likely bullshit, if you're on the receiving end of this, it's still scary. And although Review Bra wisely was very tight with details of what was going on, he did provide a few updates. In one video that he uploaded a little over a week after the mattress video, he said that things were starting to get better. With the uh, the whole stalking situation, at least it's it is starting to improve. So that's that's good news. There, you can kind of rest assured at least that it's it's starting to get better and much more recently in january of 2018 review bra responded to a new fan who was concerned about the situation i am very concerned for review bra i stumbled on his channel new year's eve and since then have watched many of his videos listened to vorw and just overall have become a genuine fan i've been watching his q a videos because i want to understand and know more about him he's just so genuine and sweet and despite only watching for a few days I just want to see him flourish in life and be happy, all that jazz. I'm sure you guys relate. Through these Q&As, I thought about looking through Reddit and look at what people were discussing. I landed on a thread that had sightings of him. Someone mentioned a stalker. I start clicking on links that took me to godawful 4chan and my blood freezes to read that someone has been stalking him. With proof given and stolen family photos. People were wanting to pay the stalker to break in and do whatever the request was, and I'm just here panicking because surely Review Bra knows, and yet he continues making videos. I'm sad at how low humanity can be, and with having limited understanding in this community, I would like someone to please explain to me if he is okay, and if not, is there anything at all that we the fans can do? Thankfully, things have gotten better in that regard. The whole issue happened in mid-2016, but I have been able to get past it and things are better now. It's hard to imagine why someone might want to mess with Ryubra, who might literally be the only YouTuber I've never seen anybody have a bad word about. But I guess that's just the internet for you. Ultimately, it's just good to know that this situation has been resolved and things are now going good for Ryubra. You can find all kinds of great stuff at a thrift store. Barely worn fashion pieces at a fraction of the cost. Fun little knickknacks from years gone by. I'll never forget the time I was on tour and we stopped in a thrift store and I found an 80s Ultimate Warrior tablecloth that we wound up using for our merch table. Or how about... a dead body? That may be the case in a developing story that begins with a Facebook group called Weird Secondhand Finds That Just Need To Be Shared. As the name implies, it's dedicated to all of the weird stuff that people find in thrift shops. Although the group is generally pretty lighthearted, it took a darker turn on April 17th of 2019 when this was posted. Found in and under a drawer of a donated desk. Edit. It was donated to the store I work at a few months ago. Pics were taken, but I don't know if anyone followed through with the report. It was sold later that day. The top of the desk drawer reads, The truth is under. And underneath it says, The body lies at, and there's a series of coordinates. Now, 
Anybody can write anything on a piece of furniture. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. In fact, when I first saw this thing, it reminded me of an old Easter egg on the Game Boy Game Genie where you put in a button combination and all of a sudden you get the message, Help! I'm a prisoner in a Game Genie factory. This could very well have been a joke just like that, but let's for a moment entertain it as if it were for real. So the first thing to do is see where these coordinates take us. By checking Google Maps, we can see that it puts us at the side of a road in the middle of the Avon Park bombing range in Highland County, Florida. Property that's owned by the US Air Force. And it's used for, you guessed it, bomb testing. So would that mean that our hypothetical suspect is in the military? Not necessarily. Although military personnel would probably be the most likely suspect, the road might be accessible to the public, and in fact, there is a YouTube video of a guy that claims that he's driving on the road. And even if not, there's still the potential that someone could have broken in. The fact that the desk was donated to a store that's located an hour and a half drive away from this place says that, at the very least, the person was local for some period of time. And although most people at first wrote this off as a joke, especially as soon as people realized that this was in the middle of a bombing range, there were some people who wanted to play amateur detective. Thankfully though, so far nobody has actually went to the spot and tried to dig like this was that episode of The Simpsons. Please don't turn this into the Big T episode of The Simpsons. The detective work on this case was ramped up a notch as a Reddit user named Woodenhead posted this to r slash WTF. The post received nearly 30,000 upvotes and hit the Reddit front page where now thousands of Redditors were in on the investigation. One person claiming to be a local described the location. I own recreational property just north of that location. As someone else mentioned, the pin location is inside the Avon Park bombing range or McDill AFB Auxiliary Field as it is officially known. If you zoom out a little bit and look north, you will see River Ranch Property Owners Association and our campsites and the fence line that separates the RRPOA and the range. We ride our four-wheelers down to the very southeast end of the property and watch them do bombing runs. Aside from trespassing on a military installation, you do not want to go trekking out there. Lots of unexploded ordnance. The base does issue permits to hunt on the base, but it's not anywhere near where the pin location is. Another Redditor claiming to be a fighter pilot who was located at this base described how the base works. Fighter pilot here. Yeah, that's a live range. There are going to be range controllers in and around that area anytime the range is cold. The giant circle is a nuke circle that we used and still occasionally use to practice tossing a nuke into. No shit. The other ones that look like tracks going into a target are strafe, gun, pits, and the ones that look like circles are traditional targets that they can score your bombs. We use these little guys. But some Redditors theorize that this would be the perfect place to leave some evidence. Wouldn't that be a good place to ditch some evidence? Sounds to me more like a joke. Some guy thought it'd be funny to give a location of somewhere clearly inaccessible and extremely unlikely to be used to hide any bodies. If this is a real murderer, he's got gigantic fucking balls to bury the body inside a military installation. Not really. Local law enforcement wouldn't want to step in any toes and would be hesitant to search unless they were absolutely sure, versus public land where anybody can stumble into anything and the cops don't need a warrant. If the killer worked there, they would have access, and it's not like the gate guards would be searching their car. There would be some camera evidence, but when you've been there for some time, you know your way around and where the blind spots are. Besides, the specific location is in a remote part that's probably rarely driven past, if at all. So, you have a quiet place that nobody's going to stumble upon you or the evidence, where local law enforcement has limited access to, that is surrounded by wildlife that will help destroy evidence. If the body is able to be ID'd though, the killer better hope there's no obvious motive or connection to them. Because if you work at a military base and your girlfriend's body turns up there, you better believe you're fucked. And the Redditors also found a list of unsolved missing persons cases. It was on the Highland County Sheriff's Office website and it contains six cases of people who have gone missing as recently as 2018 and as far back as 1988. Clearly. This is a situation for the actual police and not internet detectives, but thankfully, people have contacted the authorities. 
In fact, the Highland County Sheriff's Office has provided an update on the case. We are aware of this post making the rounds. The GPS location is in the middle of the Avon Park bombing range and the information has been passed along to Air Force officials. This update doesn't provide a ton of information, but thankfully there were some people in the original Facebook group who did manage to get in touch with the police and get a little bit more information. Okay, so I shared this to my personal group and a friend of mine lives nearish to there, so he called the local cops. Here is my friend's own words. Spoke with a Lieutenant McManus at the Polk County Sheriff's Office, or Highland County? I don't know at the moment, and gave him the relevant info on the image. Apparently their homicide detective had already been contacted by one person earlier and had brought it up to him, so he was somewhat aware. Since the area is on a military base, it's secure and unable to be really accessed at this time. They're investigating what they can do regarding it, and will, if they have to, wait until tomorrow to check into it. That's all I know. Second update. Just spoke with the homicide detective from Polk County as well. I think it was the homicide detective. He is coordinating with his counterpart at Highland County because apparently it's a rough call for exactly whose jurisdiction it is. In any event, they have to get military authorization to get out there, so it'll be a hot minute. Interestingly, beyond just being procedural red tape, it actually has a purpose. That area is actually a live bombing range and they need to be sure they won't get blown to hell and back when they do investigate. He will reach back out to me once they have investigated and verified what's up. Once I know what's what, I'll pass that info on to you and you can get it onto the page later on. And another person claimed to have gotten some more information from the police. It was said that it's believed to be someone that died on the bomb range. Less likely, a waitress that went missing years ago. And note that all of this is just word of mouth and to be taken with a grain of salt. As of now, it's unclear whether or not this case will be perpetually tied up by red tape between the police and the military, and even if they find anything, whether or not the findings will be public, but if you do want to stay updated on this case, go to reddit r slash the body. And if I find out of any developments, you can be sure that I will let you know on the channel. Anyway, I'd like to thank Wooden Head who brought this to my attention and who has been leading the investigation on r slash the body. In August of 2011, Reddit was introduced to what in my opinion would go down as its greatest mystery of all time. A partially deconstructed computer hard drive sewn into a secret compartment in a laptop bag purchased from eBay. Why would somebody go through such great lengths to conceal the contents of a hard drive? What could it possibly contain? Government secrets? Evidence of a crime? Uh, illegal pornography? Let's be serious, it's probably some kind of weird sex stuff. Regardless, it's also a fact of life that on Reddit, OP never delivers. Time and time again, a person has come to Reddit with some kind of mystery that would captivate the entire community only to have our hopes dashed of ever finding out what the truth was. But this time it seemed like things were a little bit different. The carrot of finding the truth would be dangled over Reddit's heads for a period of what's approximately six years. And in these six years, it seemed like perhaps we might actually find out what was on that hard drive. So what really did become of this mystery? Let's find out in the new episode of Tales from the Internet. Reddit was first introduced to the mystery hard drive in a post entitled, I found a mysterious hard drive sewn into a bag. How can I find out what's on it? It was posted to Ask Reddit by a user named SecretHDD on April 10th, 2011. My mother purchased a laptop from a woman on eBay. It was a really quick sale. She needed money for college and desperately needed to get rid of this laptop, bought by her parents. So we received the laptop in a bag. Laptop got parred out to fix my undeserving stepsister's laptop, bag was tossed into the garage. At some point, we moved, and finally after a while we got around to doing some spring cleaning. Like all great memories, I'm not entirely sure how this started, I just know that we were cleaning and we found the bag. My mom was emptying out the pockets, but despite the fact that all the pockets were empty, the bag still felt like it contained something. So she digs some more, no mystery pockets. Aggravated, she finally grabs a knife and tears open the bag. 
Sewn into the bag, totally indistinguishable from the rest, is this hard drive. I started asking around and we determined, I'm in no way hardware savvy, that it's an older model IBM hard drive and to add to the mystery, the bottom section of the hard drive was removed. So I'm reaching out to you Reddit. What could be on this hard drive that someone needed to remove a portion of it and sew it into a bag? And after some people asked about it, the original poster added some pictures of the hard drive and a close-up of the label. Of course, people started speculating wildly about what could possibly be on this thing, uh, most of them saying it's probably some kind of child porn and you're gonna get arrested. It also contained comments stating what we all know, that on a Reddit, the original poster never fucking delivers. If only you knew six years ago, Blaze Master. If only you knew. Others, however, came with suggestions as to how Secret HDD could actually recover the contents of the hard drive and find out. In particular, a user by the name KD5VMO gave step-by-step -step instructions on how to recover a hard drive in this situation. The first step of these instructions included purchasing an identical hard drive, something that can be a bit hard to find, but it's necessary to do this. And after that post made its way to the top, Secret HDD responded with an update that gave people a lot of hope that we might actually, for once, get to the bottom of a mystery. Okay, I've purchased this hard drive. Stay tuned in several days and I'll let everybody know what came of this. But then several days came and went, and several more days came and went, and then several more days came and went, and we finally kind of got around to accepting that. I guess this is yet another one for the pile, another mystery that will forever go unsolved. But then six months later, something interesting happened. Six months later, in October of 2011, Secret HDD posted a follow-up. Secret HDD here, update inside. And in this update, he talks about how surprised he is that Reddit stayed obsessed with finding out what was on this hard drive. He also said that despite not really wanting to pay for that hard drive, he went ahead and followed the recovery steps and he just couldn't get it to work. He even went on to recruit the help of a friend in IT to try to get it to work, but it just wasn't happening. Rather than tell us this, though, he decided that he would just not say anything because in his opinion, there's not enough mystery in the world. I'm one of those people who thinks that there isn't nearly enough mystery in this world. Sure, there's still plenty to be discovered in this world and in this universe, but let's be real. Who among us encounters such mysteries on a daily basis? How many of us have explored any of the 95% of our oceans that have been explored? Personally, I wake up at the same time every day, go do the same stuff at work every day, go home and then read Reddit or watch West Wing reruns until I fall asleep, only to be woken up in time for work the next morning. Anyway, I didn't post an update because I thought people would enjoy the ongoing mystery. Was he a troll? Did the FBI show up? Maybe there was nothing at all, but he's letting us have our fun. Turns out that I was wrong. <laughs> I, I, like I, I kind of get what he was saying, but I cannot fathom a person thinking that everyone would just be happy to be like, oh, this is a mystery and we're never going to find out. No, we need to fucking know. I thought I was adding mystery to the world, but apparently I was just letting those of you who allowed yourselves to feel a brief sense of excitement down. I seriously am sorry. But although this person was very apologetic, they also realized that this is a mystery that it can't end like that. So they offered to allow a person who pays for shipping to try and recover it themselves. And now of course this being Reddit, which at least six years ago tended to have a more technologically literate than average user base, many people came and offered their services but one man rose to the top who seemed to be the most qualified and that was a man by the name of Dovik. Dovik, whose Reddit account has since been deleted, posted, Where do you live? I'll be willing to pay the shipping if you're not too far away. I work in a lab that has all the tools needed to repair and recover this information, so I might as well give it a shot. They got in touch and then he updated his post. I've talked with Secret HDD through PM. He is well within the range to get this shipped out. We will talk tomorrow to get the shipping details down and as long as I receive the drive, I will keep everyone updated. I'll be going to bed now. Updates tomorrow. Dovik would then make one more update to his post, which contained a link to his official update on his official subreddit. Yeah, to really hammer home the fact that Dovik was the chosen one, he got his own damn subreddit for updates to the secret HDD case, as well as a kind of a quasi-cult-like following. Did you think I was exaggerating when I was talking about how much Reddit was obsessed 
with finding out the contents of this hard drive. Now, like many of his other posts, Dovik's original update has been deleted, however, in the comments of that post, you do have confirmation from Secret HDD that they've been in touch and they're moving forward with the exchange of the hard drive. And the community was satisfied for a bit. There was excitement that we would finally get to the bottom of one of these massive community-spanning mysteries. Until Dovik himself would go on to disappear much like Secret HDD before him. However, a few weeks would pass after that initial update and, understandably, the community became impatient once again. In particular, a user by the name of Dovitualize used their research skills to, uh, essentially do what they can to try and dock this guy. They went through his Reddit history and discovered that he was very into Call of Duty Black Ops at the time, and in fact, had actually played in some tournaments under the name Dovic. They discovered they had a YouTube page that contained a lot of Call of Duty Black Ops gameplay videos. Unfortunately, however, much like his Reddit posting history, his YouTube posting history had also gone cold. His last video had been posted three months prior to this digging into his history. On this YouTube, he also listed a Gmail address that he would accept gameplay submissions on. Users of the Dovik subreddit contacted him at this Gmail address, inspiring him to finally come back and explain what's been going on. Hello. I've got to say that I'm quite impressed that this subreddit is still active. I would of... <laughs> I would have swore that after a month, it would have... Oh my god. It would have died off. However, all that aside, I will let you all know what has been happening and explain the lack of communication on my part. I was contacted by Secret HDD, we are not the same person by the way, for an address to send the hard drive out. Unfortunately, I had emergencies at work that had to be taken care of, and I didn't leave time for much else in my life besides my family. I should of oh my stop it dude. I should have talked to Secret HDD about this, so at the very least, they would be able to send it to someone with more time. That was an oversight by me. I have contacted this user and sent them my address if they still want to send the drive to me for an attempted repair. And that update was enough to reinstill confidence in the community. This guy isn't gonna vanish. He's gonna let us know what's on that hard drive. But then he vanished again. This time forever. Or so it would seem. People on the Dovik subreddit would from time to time post jokes, make fake Dovik names, saying, Oh, they got the hard drive now, here's what's on it. Uh, a lot of cult-like religious jokes, but really, no ground was being made in this mystery. That would be until approximately about a year ago, when someone decided to take another look at that YouTube channel that brought him back in the first place. They had looked at the names of some of the people that Dovik was playing Call of Duty with, and they started to go into the channels of these people. Of these other players, one person stuck out, a guy by the name of Cheddar Chez. With Dovik's Reddit account gone, and his other accounts that Reddit knew about having gone cold, this Cheddar Chez, Cheddar Cheese guy was perhaps our final link to the man himself. So after about four to five years of this case having gone cold, people reached out to Cheddar Cheese for what might possibly be an actual resolution to the secret HDD mystery. And it worked! They made contact with the Cheddar Cheese guy! After being contacted by people interested in the Dovik mystery, Cheddar Cheese came to the Dovik subreddit. You found me. I may have means of contacting Dovik. While I haven't spoken with him personally, I do have his info on other accounts, and he was last seen online 27 days ago. I'll reach out to someone else I know who I remember saying he actually spoke with Dovik. You guys are really going to great lengths to find a guy I haven't spoken to in 7 years, lol. And it was finally fucking happening. After so many years, so many people dedicated to solving an obscure mystery on some corner of the internet about a mysterious hard drive that who knows what was on it, but we had to know. It was finally being solved. Contact has been made. I thought about letting the dream and mystery live on, but it's time for the truth. What is it with these people and letting mysteries live on? We don't want that. Nobody wants that. And he goes on to post a conversation on Steam with Dovik, the man himself. Hey, Garrett told me to message you. What's up, man? Hey, do you realize an entire subreddit has been actively trying to find you, lol? To the point where they found our old MLG videos from years ago. About that secret hard drive thing. Prior to you deleting your Reddit. LOL, oh wow, yeah, the guy never sent the hard drive. <laughs> Cheese then goes on to ask Dovik what he should tell us happened. Well, if you want, you can tell them there's nothing to it. 
The guy never sent the drive, so I couldn't do anything. Weird that anyone still cares, lol. So there you go. That's what happened with Dovik. He never got the goddamn hard drive. Secret HDD never sent him the fucking hard drive. Six years, a subreddit, thousands of Redditors obsessed with this story, and the hard drive was never sent to the guy who was supposed to recover it. All these years of chasing Dobik, and in the end, he never even had the hard drive. Does this mean that the story is over? Perhaps not. I mean, Secret HD, you're still out there somewhere. If you see this video, please. Fucking please, your Reddit account is still there. Your Reddit account still exists. Go on there and make this right. I've called this Reddit's greatest unsolved mystery, but it doesn't have to remain unsolved. We can find out what's on that hard drive. Maybe it won't be Dilbic to do it, but someone can. Someone can. But anyway, that's what happened, guys. Hopefully there'll be an update to this story someday. I'm not gonna hold my breath, but be sure to join me on the next Tales from the Internet. When telling the story of something that actually happened in real life, you often wind up with an unsatisfying conclusion. That's because, unlike fiction, you don't have an author with a vested interest in making sure all the loose ends are tied up. And of all the stories that I've ever covered on the channel, there's probably none that exemplifies this more than the story of the mysterious hard drive found hidden in a bag by a Redditor. What I didn't anticipate, though, is that you got so invested in this story that you wound up breathing new life into this story that had gone cold for years. And in doing so, you brought some old players back into the fold, adding a new chapter to the story of Secret HDD. And if you haven't watched my video on Secret HDD, I'm gonna recommend you do that first, because otherwise none of this is gonna make any sense to you. Or if you don't want to, here's a quick summary. Redditor's mother buys a bag on eBay where they find a hard drive sewn into a compartment in the bag. The hard drive is broken and unusable, but another Redditor named Dobik says that he can recover the information. Arrangements are made for the hard drive to be sent to Dovik, and then the original bolster disappears, and for more than six years people go back and forth trying to figure out what was on the hard drive and what happened to Dovik and the original poster. And I also want to give a shout out to Tim Maverick on Twitter for bringing this to my attention. The first update to this story begins on August 15th of this past summer when a user named Dovik underscore 123 posted on the Dovik subreddit. AMA Dovik. Hello everyone. I was requested by a Reddit user to come to the sub and answer any lingering questions about this mystery. I am you Dovik. I'm not sure what is the best way to provide confirmation of this. Anyone have an idea that would satisfy the majority? I was contacted by Chez a while ago about this and the ongoing community. I can't think of anything else to add to what I told him back then. Secret HDD never sent the hard drive after I contacted them. The best bet the community has to get closure on all this is for Secret HDD to resurface with the drive. Unfortunately, I'm no longer at the lab I was at when all this came about, so I don't really have the tools to recover the drive. I'll answer any questions that you all have. And for obvious reasons, a lot of people doubted the authenticity of Dovik123 because so many people have come there either claiming to be Dovik or Secret HDD. So he wound up verifying himself by posting a video to his confirmed YouTube account. This video showed him being logged into Reddit using the Dovik123 account. Additionally, he also confirmed his identity by sending a picture of himself to the mod Desmodes. A lot of people were curious about his correspondence with Secret HDD. What else did Secret HDD tell you about the hard drive? Secret HDD didn't tell me anything special about the hard drive. The extra one that was bought was going to be sent with the hard drive that needed to be recovered. I was going to check to see if that extra drive would work for a board replacement or if I needed to find another one. What was Secret HDD like based on your interactions? Was he kind of weird and sketchy or did he seem like a well-adjusted normal dude? Seemed normal to me. Really though, I didn't have enough interactions with him to really get a good reading. Okay, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say welcome back and thanks for posting. I guess I'd ask you, did you ever talk with Secret HDD? Did you lose interest because he never got back to you? And have you seen Wang's video posted a few months ago on this sub? I still hold a glimmer of hope that this mystery can be solved, even if it is just an empty drive. I only talked with Secret HDD through PMs, and when it came time to actually send the hard drive, I never heard back from him. 
I posted an update on that, and then left it at that because I didn't have any further updates to give. So eventually, I lost interest. I just watched the video. Okay, Scott? Hey! I really wish there was more we could do to figure out the big mystery. Some users were curious about why he deleted his account. I don't remember when I deleted my account exactly. I checked Reddit more and more infrequently and each time I came back, I would have to respond to a lot of PMs about the hard drive. I got tired of doing this and decided to delete the account. I don't use Reddit as much anymore anyways. And of course, others were curious about what his thoughts were on what might actually be on the hard drive. I don't remember if there are any details on the original eBay seller. I don't recall any provided by Secret HDD. The drive itself most likely contained boring contents. Nothing interesting. It is fun to think about all the weird or crazy things that could be on it, but that speculation doesn't get us anywhere, unfortunately. He also conceded that it was a distinct possibility that the entire thing was fake and he, and us, were all taken in by it. But aside from confirmation that he's still alive and a little bit of where they now type information, Dovik's reappearance didn't really add that much to what we already knew to the story. That arrangements were made and when the time finally came for Secret HDD to send the drive over, he disappeared. But then, about a week after Dovik's post was made, another post was made by a user named Secret HDD is over. This post was entitled, Please just stop, this was all a joke. I'm sorry if this is anticlimactic, this is just a joke that's gone on too long. You guys have spent over six years and never gave up, and I'm both sorry and gracious for this. I don't have access to my old email, it's been six years and I totally forgot about this whole thing, but I just came here to tell you the truth. This was all just a joke me and my friend decided to do in middle school. We had access to a few bits of technology, his father used to own a PC repair shop, and no, it was shut down, and no, I'm not telling you any information about who they were or who I am, and we have since split apart. We have no idea where to go with the story and just decided to end it in the only way we could think. Just forget about it and let it die as a mystery. I don't know where my friend is and his PC was the one with the email and the Reddit account. I understand I have no real way to verify this and feel free to continue doing this if you enjoy it. That was our intent all along, but I just feel guilty for all of the suspense I built up and the anger you have portrayed. I no longer have the HDD or the account as my ex-friend left with them when he moved. Thank you, sorry, and goodbye. And this post was met with even more skepticism than the Dovik post. Okay, if that is true, you have to give us something, anything. I mean, how can we trust the word of a random user? Hell, a picture of the table the hard drive was pictured on. Really? Track your friend down. Tell him he's a Reddit legend. I mean, your story is very believable, but it doesn't give us closure because it has no credibility. I doubt it would be possible. He moved away long ago and I only know his first name. My friend, I only know his first name, laughing emojis. It's been a half a decade since we've talked and we weren't even that close. What do you expect? Press X to doubt. I know the last names of my friends from elementary school. You're full of shit. Just because you do doesn't mean anything. Just because you allegedly remember the names of people from elementary doesn't mean I have an obligation to know the name of a person I used to hang out with and did something for a little bit with in middle school over half a decade ago. You guys may be strangely obsessed with this, but I'm not. Why don't you go figure out how logical thinking works? Who are you? I'm the original Secret HDD. Bullshit. Plus one. Total BS. And you should note that that last comment there was posted by Desmodes, the very same mod who verified Dovik. Keep that in mind as we move forward with this story. See, this post was made in August, but ever since then, people would occasionally show up to the subreddit and post in that thread. And when people posted in that thread, Secret HDD is over was there to respond to them. This kept happening for over a month until October 2nd. It was on October 2nd when the mod Desmodes had finally had enough and started to antagonize Secret HDD is over. Literally should delete this, but want to keep up how dumb you are forever. You can't trick us, rando account. Keep the faith, brothers and sisters. If you want me to delete the account, I'm willing to. I guess there's no harm in doing so anymore. Log into the original account. Dovik gave us proof. You have no proof right now. I've already done my best to make it clear I don't have the account. 
It was on his computer as I didn't have any internet connected technology at the time. I am willing to do anything to prove it if I can. But it's been six years, I've moved between states, lost accounts, and forgotten things. I really don't know what to do, but I'm fine with deleting this. I didn't really expect there to be so much backlash, but I suppose it makes sense you would be skeptical. If there's anything I can do, I'll do it. The Temptress tests our faith. In Dilbic we trust, in Dilbic we love. Dilbic 123, I leave it up in your hands. I already contacted him. He said he couldn't prove it or do much since he didn't have the account. If you mean for him to decide whether or not I delete this account, if nothing comes from it, I likely will. I'm sorry this has caused so much turmoil. I remember the names of all my childhood friends. Your story is whack, just like your ability to remember passwords. Tell us something that you and Dilvik talked about in the PMs. I remember his first name, but I don't remember his last name. It's not like it was even my account. He's the one who made it and set up everything. I was just there to help with little ideas and corrections. Me and Dovik didn't even talk too much either the six years ago we did. Nothing was that insanely special about what we did talk about, and it just kind of fell apart. At the time, this wasn't something that we put all of our time and effort into. It was just something we did for fun. What is your friend's first name? What did you talk about in the PM? We have access to some of that correspondence. If you are telling the truth, we could use that for verification. Christian. And the only reason I remember that was because I used to joke about religion. Me and Dovik talked about how to transport the HDD to him, and that's the most I remember about it. We didn't get into any super interesting details, and it was a very impersonal thing. And that last comment by Secret HDD is over was posted at 6.34pm Eastern Standard Time. It's at that point that him and Desmos begin to talk in private messages. Almost exactly an hour later, at 7.32pm Eastern Standard Time, Desmos begins a new common thread and stickies it. Having a good back and forth with Secret HDD is over. I'm actually starting to believe, boys and girls, I think this is the real thing. And a little over a week later, on October 11th, Desmodes returns to reply to a comment on that sticky thread. Actual proof? I'm not buying it. He's confirming some details that I'm able to check on. Nothing 109% concrete yet, but have a good lead on the original Secret HDD account. So something that was said in those private messages convinced Desmodes of Secret HDD is over his identity. He didn't say what exactly, perhaps because it was something personally identifying and nobody wants to get doxxed over a story like this, but something. It's telling that the guy who at first was the most skeptical and who of everybody probably had the most inside knowledge was convinced by whatever was said. So although we cannot verify this 100%, it's very likely that the story of Reddit's secret hard drive was in fact a prank pulled by two middle school children. And of course, Christian, whose father owned the PC store, if you actually exist and you're out there watching this, you could always come forward and tell us what you know about the secret HDD account. Today I've got what I believe to be a Tales from the Internet first. One of the channel's longest running mysteries has officially come to a close. You might recall the tale of a mysterious hard drive found on Reddit and a user named Dovik. If you don't, you should probably watch my other videos on the topic, but if you don't feel like it, here's a quick summary. In 2011, a Reddit user named SecretHDD claimed that his mother found a hard drive sewn into a bag that they bought on eBay. The hard drive was broken and unreadable, but a user named Dovik claimed that they would be able to fix it and retrieve the data that was saved on it. Years passed, however, and Dovik was never sent the hard drive, and eventually he just disappeared. After my first video on the topic, was released, Dovik returned and was verified by a Reddit mod, however, his AMA yielded little to no results outside of the revelation that he still had never received the hard drive. Later on, a person claiming to be the original Secret HDD arrived, being mocked summarily by the Reddit community and the mod Desmodes. However, after exchanging private DMs, Desmodes was convinced by the person that they were in fact the original Secret HDD, although he never revealed the private details as to why. And that brings us to today. If you visited r slash Dovik in the past week, you might have realized that posting was turned off. And pinned was a post by the mod Desmodes. And in this post lies the final 
true story of Secret HDD confirmed by the people involved. And it also contains a shocking, or maybe not so shocking, revelation about Dovik's identity. Final post, the Dovik Saga. Hey all, as an avid follower of the Dovik slash Secret HDD Saga, I'd like to lay to rest what has been a very long series of events. I've now been given verifiable proof of identities of two of the people involved and traded Facebook messages with none other than Dovik himself. The whole thing started with two dumb high school freshmen in Minnesota. Apparently, there was an actual hard drive involved, but it was just taken from an old computer at the school. They thought it would be fun to play a prank on Reddit and see what happened. Neither expected it to get big. When it got big, the boy with the account SecretHDD, who was more of an avid Reddit user, got scared. The boy with the account Dovik started getting doxxed because he played a lot of Call of Duty and his YouTube, which had some links to his identity, became fairly public information. Several of his IRL friends got tagged and involved by Sluice from the subreddit. That freaked him out and he deleted his Reddit account. And this, I believe, is our first official confirmation that Dovik wasn't some mysterious other entity with tools to fix hard drives. He was just a high school kid who knew Secret HDD. The two boys slowly separated in their own social circles. Dovig's family moved away from Minnesota in the middle of their sophomore year of high school. The boys didn't really ever talk much. The owner of Secret HDD forgot the password they used when they created the account literally at the school library. The subreddit continued on and persevered through the years. Unfortunately, one of the mods early on ended up deleting quite a bit of information that was on the subreddit. I inquired about becoming a mod and was able to restore some of them. Earlier this year, I made contact with what I thought was a troll account, but after quizzing for proof and basically doxing him, I was able to confirm his story, found Dovik online through his real identity, and compared some things he had DM'd us for his AMA, and had discourse which confirmed the story. Desmodes then follows up with some of the most relevant links to the story, including the original post, the infamous doxing post that scared Dovik off of Reddit, my first video on the topic, and the later AMAs from both Dovik and Secret HDD. Desmodes then concluded with his thoughts about the entire situation. I think the entire story of Dovik has been amazing. Yes, what started out as a troll has led many of us to find courage in the Dovik, and realize that Dovik is more than a boy. Dovik is an idea. Dovik is the eternal bond between all of us. With that said, I think it's best for this subreddit to no longer allow posting, to let it stand as a memorial for what we have all gone through. If someone would like to start another subreddit where you can discuss Dovik, please feel free to. Maybe r slash Dovik meta. Anyway, I hope I am able to provide some closure for you. Much love to you all. May the Dovik be with you, brothers and sisters. And there you have it. A caper that has lasted for nearly a decade finally comes to an end. Also, it appears that since I started making this video, r slash Dovik has reopened submissions and the final post is already not the final post anymore. Season 6 of The Simpsons is generally regarded to be one of the best seasons of the show's 30 plus year run. It had some of the most classic episodes of the entire series. Itchy and Scratchy Land. The Stonecutters, Bart's Girlfriend, pretty much every single episode of this season is top tier. And the season finale, although there probably are better episodes in that season, is probably the most famous episode of the entire series. I'm talking about Who Shot Mr. Burns, which left us on a massive cliffhanger that had everybody guessing who did it throughout the whole summer. But of course by now we all know who did it, so why talk about such an old episode? Well, recently, somebody noticed a little detail in the episode that might tell a story that went unnoticed for decades. Look at this frame. Do you notice anything weird about it? If you did, you probably have more questions than answers right now. And if you didn't notice anything, bear with me. For this video, let's take a closer look at who shot Mr. Burns. Who Shot Mr. Burns begins with the tragic death of the beloved class pet, Super Dude. When groundskeeper Willie goes to bury him, he unexpectedly strikes oil, making Springfield Elementary rich. 
But while the school faculty is planning on how they're going to spend the school's newfound wealth, Mr. Burns hatches a scheme to steal it from them. He winds up doing this by tapping the well before they do. And throughout the episode, Mr. Burns manages to accumulate more and more enemies. Like Homer, whose name he can't remember. And Bart, who vows revenge after a gush of oil breaks his dog's legs. And Moe, whose bar closes because of the fumes. And Barney, who can't drink at Moe's bar anymore. Not to mention guest star Tito Puente. This all culminates in a town hall meeting where the citizens of Springfield decide what they're gonna do about Mr. Burns. A meeting that Mr. Burns interrupts by blocking out the sun. Infuriated, the residents of Springfield empty out into the streets and somebody shoots Mr. Burns off camera. This sets off the mystery that captivated America for the entire summer of 1995. Everyone was a suspect. Everyone had a motivation to kill Mr. Burns. And ultimately, when the Simpsons came back that fall, it was revealed that the culprit was none other than Maggie Simpson, who accidentally shot Mr. Burns when he was trying to steal her candy. It was an episode full of red herrings and misdirection, yet one such attempt at throwing people off the trail might have went unnoticed for decades. In an r slash ask reddit thread, a user named Game of Jabrones responded to a post asking what fan theory about a movie, TV show, or video game do you see as 100% canon? In the Who Shot Mr. Burns episode of The Simpsons, Mr. Burns is discovered shortly after being shot and is surrounded by a number of characters, including Krusty the Clown. However, on close inspection, it is absolutely irrefutable that it isn't Krusty at all, but Homer Simpson in Krusty makeup compared to when Homer dressed up as Krusty while in Clown College. Homer was actively on his way to kill Mr. Burns while disguised as Krusty, echoing when he saw Sideshow Bob rob the Quickie Mart while disguised as Krusty, but was beaten by mere seconds when Maggie shot him. Brian Xerox rewatches and pauses Who Shot Mr. Burns, Part 1, cross-references with Krusty character design. Holy shit, that is mind-blowing. It really is Homer. Even the way he suspiciously eyes up Ned Flanders' tracks. Good eye. What an easter egg. Now aside from the hair and the clown makeup, Homer and Krusty the Clown do look extremely similar, down to having the same exact body shape. And these similarities are by design, because originally Krusty the Clown was supposed to secretly be Homer. It was gonna be kind of an ironic thing where Bart looked up to Krusty as a hero, but then he had absolutely no respect for Homer, despite them being the same person. That twist was completely abandoned before the show was ever made, but the similarities stayed there. But they do have some differences. The main giveaways are that Krusty has bags under his eyes, he wears a rubber nose, and he has a droopier mouth than Homer. In the episode Homie the Clown, which also happened in season 6 a few episodes before Who Shot Mr. Burns, we can see that even when dressed up like Krusty, they can still be distinguished through these characteristics. And it's these differences that are apparent when we're looking at Krusty the Clown at the end of Who Shot Mr. Burns. No eye bags, a round mouth, and a painted on nose as opposed to a rubber one. Pretty clearly Homer disguised as Krusty, right? And the theory that this is actually Homer and not Krusty has a few other points to support it. First and most importantly, Homer isn't present in this scene. And then you also have the plot point that Krusty had been on vacation. He gets back to Springfield during the town hall meeting just after Mr. Burns blocked out the sun. He's wearing shorts and a shirt with the collar unbuttoned. Yet, if we look at the last scene, he's suddenly wearing a bow tie. Why would Krusty, amidst all this panic, take it upon himself to suddenly change into his show attire? Especially when he had just gotten back from vacation and didn't even have a chance to go home yet. Homer, on the other hand, was shown consciously planning to go shoot Mr. Burns. He could very well have planned this disguise ahead of time, and he only just got a Krusty costume a few episodes ago. And since Homer had already seen someone impersonate Krusty while committing a crime, and they almost got away with it, it wouldn't be unthinkable for him to try it himself. To me, in an episode like this that's very deliberately trying to put a bunch of clues out, put a bunch of red herrings out, and is trying to basically just get people guessing who did it, it would make sense for them to put in these kinds of details to lead you in different directions. This was an event that was all about misdirection, even behind the scenes. 
to prevent the true ending from being leaked, they even went as far as to animate a few different fake endings. Some of which were shown later on in a clip episode. So it might be possible that the angle where Homer is dressed up as Krusty might have been a part of one of the fake endings. But at this point, nobody really knew for sure. But we would find out more about this theory when it was posted to Twitter by a user named BrianKidsMate2. His tweet about it went super viral with almost 15,000 retweets. How the fuck did I never spot this? And it was because of this tweet that we'd wind up finding what the truth about this situation was. As fans debated over whether this was Homer or whether this was Krusty, Bill Oakley, who was a writer on the episode, chimed in. This is inaccurate. That is Krusty, not Homer in a Krusty disguise. And later on, he actually managed to dig up the original script from this episode. Okay, I found this on my computer. Haven't looked at this file in 25 years. Please note, I do not think all these appeared in the final show. But you will see that we specifically ask that Homer should not appear in the final scene. And we do not ask that he be disguised as Krusty. The pertinent part of the script reads as follows. None of the prime suspects. Homer, Bart, Lisa, Grandpa, Skinner, Willie, Smithers, Moe, Barney, Tito Puente should be visible on the street or in the crowd at the end. So the final word from one of the episode's writers and corroborated by the actual script tells us that this is Krusty and not Homer in disguise. Furthermore, as Bill pointed out, Homer's Krusty costume from the episode earlier in the season is actually a little bit different. When Homer's crusty, he doesn't have the middle tuft of hair on his head, but in this scene he does. Meaning that this is kind of a weird amalgamation of actual crusty and Homer dressed up as crusty. And with that in mind, we have to ask the question, why would such a mistake exist? It's more than a simple case of Krusty being drawn off model by accident because he's seen like this in multiple different shots. This is what Bill thinks happened. It's very possible that, despite the fact that the script specifically said not to put Homer in the scene, the animators made a mistake and put him in there anyway. And I remember following this throughout that summer, and probably more than anybody else, people thought that Homer was the shooter. And a big part of that speculation was fueled by the fact that he wasn't in that scene. This was something that was definitely very much by design, and it couldn't be compromised on, so if Homer was put in there accidentally, they had to redo it. So what's the simplest way to fix this problem? Instead of redrawing the entire scene, you just take Homer and turn him into Krusty because they're almost the same anyway. So although the theory that this character is Homer dressed up as Krusty can be justified, it's most likely a case where this was simply a mistake that was covered up a little bit sloppily. On Sunday night, November 22nd, 1987, residents of Chicago were sitting down to watch the local news on WGN-TV when a report about the Chicago Bears was suddenly interrupted by a mysterious video. The video had no audio and only depicted a man in a Max Headroom mask. After the interruption stopped, the anchor, Dan Rohn, had this to say. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Max Headroom, as I'm assuming some of you don't know, is a character who is supposed to be the world's first computer-generated TV host. Headroom. Max Headroom. He was a very popular character around the time this happened, and it's safe to assume that most of the audience recognized him. And this would not be the last appearance of the man with the Max Headroom mask that night. A few hours later, a broadcast of Doctor Who on WTTW-TV in Chicago was also interrupted by the hacker. And this time, there was audio. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. I drink some dry clothes. The Chuck Swirsky that he's talking about is a sportscaster for WGN-TV, who you might remember was the first station that got hacked. Jesus. <laughs> At the time of this hack, the real Max Headroom was the spokesperson for the new Coke. That's the wave. Coke. <sighs> <laughs> 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 
Note that the song he's singing here is the theme song from an old cartoon called Clutch Cargo. Clutch Cargo with his pal Spinner and Paddlefoot in another exciting adventure, Pirate Isle. Oogalooga, Clutch Cargo. Oogalooga to you, Snowshoe. <laughs> The Max Headroom signal intrusion incident quickly became national news, and the FCC was immediately on the case. I know a lot of people think of the FCC as the organization whose job it is to keep dirty words off of TV, but really, their job is to protect the integrity of the airwaves in situations such as this. And they were pretty confident that they would catch the person behind the Max Headroom hacking. But the odds, I'd say, if a guy continues to involve himself, either sporadically or continuously, uh, it's very great that we will determine who it is. They've done it before, and signal intrusions like the Max Headroom one were nothing new. Just a year earlier, a hacker calling himself Captain Midnight had interrupted HBO's broadcast and displayed this message in protest of HBO's new price hikes. They quickly figured out that he was actually an engineer named John McDougal, and he was promptly arrested. But the difference here, and a big reason why the Max Headroom incident continues to capture people's imagination is that 30 plus years later, he still hasn't been caught. But there are a few suspects. The first theory about a Max Headroom suspect claims that it was a musician named Eric Fournier behind the hack. The primary piece of evidence that people use to tie these two together are the aesthetic similarities between the Max Headroom video and a video series created by Eric. This series stars a character called Shea St. John, and he had a few standalone movies for it, as well as some videos that were kind of popular in the early days of YouTube. Unfortunately, his original channel was deleted by YouTube, a big surprise there. But the videos that do remain do reveal a kind of similarity. Susie, you yes, forget if she does Ron John selling the drip drop diet that I'm doing down in Hollywood. Two drops for two pounds. Yeah, I'm doing the drip drop diet. Two drops, two pounds. According to Vice Motherboard, the Eric Fournier theory is as follows. The legend is that Eric, who lived in nearby Bloomington, Indiana at the time and played in a punk band called The Blood Farmers, simply wanted exposure for his band's music videos. At the last minute, he decided to ditch the idea of broadcasting one of their videos out of fear that they would be identified and reverted instead to his own spontaneous performance. The idea that Eric reverted to a spontaneous performance to me contradicts what we see in the actual video. The Max Headroom video could obviously not have been performed live as there's a very clear cut when they jumped to the spanking scene. Or as this newscaster referred to the scene. A portion of his or her anatomy. A portion of his anatomy. <laughs> I'm so glad TV's dying. Another piece of evidence contradicting this theory is that one of Eric's former bandmates said that none of them ever went to Chicago. They didn't have the technical knowledge required to pull this off. And even if they did, they didn't have any music videos to play at all. And unfortunately, Eric himself isn't able to deny this theory as he passed away in 2010, leaving behind the mystery and his creepy artwork. But the same year Eric passed away, another set of suspects emerged. In a Reddit post made in 2010, a user named B. Pogue claimed that he might know who did it. In this post, B. Pogue told the story of two brothers who he nicknamed J and K so as not to potentially reveal their identities to the FCC or anyone who might still want to prosecute them for this crime. J and K were two brothers who were deeply involved in Chicago's local hacking and freaking scene in the 80s and 90s. Having an interest in this but being significantly younger, B. Pogue was a bit of a hanger-on in the scene. Although he mostly communicated with these people through dial-up bulletin board services, there were a few occasions where they would meet up in real life. And it was one of these real-life meetups that might have potentially exposed the person behind the Max Headroom hackings. One of these get-togethers was in an apartment in a town called LaGrange, a suburb of Chicago, in the winter of 1987. Kay lived in a shared apartment with his girlfriend along with a roommate, also a fellow hacker, who we'll refer to as M. 
Practically every square inch with the exception of one corner was packed with systems working and some apparently non-working. Anyway, the apartment was located in a rather rundown looking apartment high-rise, maybe four to five stories tall, located within walking distance of a pizza hut. We all walked over there and did lunch and dinner there that day. Before he gets into the details of what was said that day, he explains why he believes that Jay was the man behind the mask. The first point, he says, is that Jay had the same sense of humor as the guy in the video. Jay, despite having fairly severe autism and coming off as basically crazy, was actually kind of funny. His sense of humor was sort of disturbing, sort of sexually deviant in nature. Although it's circumstantial, this is the first bit of evidence I have. The Max Headroom video features a guy who at one point holds up what appears to be a vibrator or a dildo, or as the reporter would say, the display of a marital aid. The end of the video shows a woman dressed up like Annie Oakley swatting someone's bare ass with a fly swatter. This is the sort of humor that Jay loved. All of his jokes constantly involved something childish and or sexually deviant. The video, for all intents and purposes, is a perfect reflection of Jay's sense of humor, scattered, nervous, and comically sexually deviant. But it wasn't just the sense of humor, it was also the speaking patterns that B. Pogue said resembled Jay's. Here's an example of a conversation he gave to demonstrate this. Hey Jay, how old are you anyway? Oh, do you know why I told you not to sit in the front seat? Why? Oh, in case you said something stupid. What do you mean? There's a surprise under the seat for people who say something stupid. Oh, if you say something stupid, huh? What TV shows do you watch? I don't really watch TV. Hey, I'm hungry. Ooh, I hope you don't say something stupid. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that Jay often jumped around randomly back and forth to different subjects when he talked. He never really kept a clear line of conversation. This brings us to the next bit of circumstantial evidence. If you watch the video, the person behind the mask jumps around in exactly the same way as Jay. The problem is, I never spoke with Jay for anything other than that ride home, but the way he spoke was in line with the type of verbal mannerisms of the guy in the mask. Where most people would say, um, in conversation, Jay said, oh, in various lengths. Oh, if he struggled to find something to say. Another small circumstantial piece of evidence was the Clutch Cargo connection. It's a minor point, but Clutch Cargo would have also been contemporaneous to Jay's childhood. Clutch Cargo was an early 60s cartoon. Only someone born in the 50s would have been able to sing the theme song. If Jay was about 30 at the time, 1987, then this would make sense. But as B. Pogue said, this is all circumstantial evidence. The real smoking gun in this case was something a lot more substantial. Jay was at the party in the apartment that afternoon. I didn't talk with him directly. Me and the friend of mine that I was there with didn't really talk to anybody that day. But I did overhear what the others were talking about. They were referring to Jay planning to do something big over the weekend. I remember that word, big, because it piqued my curiosity as to what might be considered big by their standards. I later asked them collectively during the dinner we all had at Pizza Hut later that night what they were talking about earlier, what big was. And someone, probably Kay, told me to just watch Channel 11 later that night as sort of an offhanded suggestion. I did happen to be watching Channel 11 later that night, having forgotten about the whole big conversation earlier that day. I saw it, but I didn't put two and two together at the time. So putting all this together, B. Pogue said that it was his belief that Jay was Max Headroom, Kay was the cameraman, and Kay's girlfriend was the girl with the fly swatter. Three years later, another Redditor named Animosity came forward to corroborate some of the details of B. Pogue's story. So do you think those two brothers did it? The TLDR version is yes, I do. Here's the long version. In 1987, I was 16 and D-Dial BBS were coming to a slow close. These guys were part of the local BBS D-Dial scene, which is how I knew them. I was kind of interested in their roomie as a potential hookup and drove to the apartment a time or two to hang out. I remember seeing heavy duty AV equipment there, but I had no idea what it was used for and no one was interested in enlightening me. After the broadcast was broken into, word was going around the D-Dial scene about who did it. Fingers were being pointed at the guys living in the apartment. Of course it was all denied, denied, denied because of the deep shit they got themselves into and no one ratted anyone out. So it really seemed like B. Pogue was onto something and other locals of Chicago who were familiar with the scene agreed with him. But in October of 2015, B. Pogue came with yet another update that twisted the story in another direction. 
In the time since his last update, B. Polk had become acquainted with Rick Klein, who was the curator of the Museum of Classic Chicago Television. Together, they came in contact with people close to the situation who were able to shine new light on it. Several weeks ago, Rick and I had the luxury of meeting and speaking with several engineers and technicians who were actively working for WBBM, WTTW, WGN, and other companies in the Chicago broadcasting community at the time. They yielded a wealth of very detailed information, including specifics about what kind of locations, gear, physical access, and more importantly, what sort of station-specific knowledge would have been necessary in order to pull off the intrusions themselves. This was the kind of heavy engineering perspective knowledge that we had only had bits and pieces to work with before and had been trying to obtain for some time and with great difficulty. After the last round of interviews and having looked at the resulting evidence pile in total, Rick and I have concluded that the possibility of this having been an outside job is basically zero. To make a long story short, all the things which needed to have been possessed by an outside amateur or amateurs, no matter how talented, simply did not exist in the wild in 1987. This, and other information we are never able to corroborate, is what allows us to free J and K as suspects with full confidence. If the information they gained is true and J and K can't possibly be the suspects, this means that it had to be a job performed by someone who was in the Chicago broadcasting community. They had to have had both the knowledge necessary and access to the professional equipment to pull off the hack. So if I had to take a shot in the dark and guess, I would think that the person responsible for the hack was a broadcaster who had some kind of personal vendetta with Chuck Swirsky, who he said that he was better than, or perhaps WGN-TV itself, which he referred to as world's greatest newspaper nerds. Some sort of professional jealousy or rivalry is the only thing I can think of at this point. It's either that or maybe they just did it for the lulls. You might be surprised to find out that eBay isn't just for used video games and bootleg sneakers. Does that say SPIV350? You can also find all kinds of mysterious items. Like this Cheeto that looks like a golden retriever. Or this Cheeto that looks like vanilla ice. Or this Cheeto that looks like bald and brash, aka belongs in the trash. Alright, the weird side of eBay isn't quite what it used to be. So let's take a trip back to the year 2000. Back when the weird side of eBay had a bit more of a mysterious aura, and an allegedly haunted painting took the internet by storm. This is the story of the hands resist him. The early days of eBay were primarily characterized by just how ridiculous some of the weird items on the site were. Especially when you got to the more supernatural things. There were all sorts of supposedly magical or haunted knickknacks up for sale alongside depreciating Beanie Babies. At that point, it was almost entirely what the site was known for. For example, I vividly recall the owner of one website, I think it was xentertainment.com, had dug up a jar of dirt from his backyard and sold it on eBay as a magic kit for $20. But on February 2nd of the year 2000, a listing posted by an eBayer named Mr. No Reserve was taken a bit more seriously. It was of a creepy painting that depicted an angry looking child standing next to an eyeless doll. Behind them was a door with several hands reaching out from a black void. The listing read as follows. When we received this painting, we thought it was really good art. A picker had found it abandoned behind an old brewery. At the time, we wondered a little why a seemingly perfectly fine painting would be discarded like that. Today, we don't. One morning, our four and a half year old daughter claimed that the children in the picture were fighting and coming into the room during the night. Now, I don't believe in UFOs or Elvis being alive, but my husband was alarmed. To my amusement, he set up a motion triggered camera for the nights. After three nights, there were pictures. The last two pictures shown are from that stakeout. After seeing the boy seemingly exiting the painting under threat, we decided the painting has to go. Please judge for yourself. 
And these are the pictures of the characters allegedly fighting and the boy leaving the painting. To me, it just seems like they made the side of the picture a little bit red, but I have no idea how such effect could be achieved. They finished the listing off with a warning. Warning! Do not bid on this painting if you are susceptible to stress-related disease, faint of heart, or are unfamiliar with supernatural events. By bidding on this painting, you agree to release the owners of all liability in relation to the sale or any events happening after the sale that might be contributed to this painting. This painting may or may not possess supernatural powers that could impact or change your life. However, by bidding, you agree to exclusively bid on the value of the artwork with disregard to the last two photos featured in this auction and hold the owners harmless in regard to them and their impact, expressed or implied. Now that we got this out of the way, one question to you eBayers. We want our house to be blessed after the painting is gone. Does anybody know who is qualified to do that? Clearly, these people were in a big rush to get this haunted painting out of their home. Although, I guess not that much of a rush considering the $199 starting price, but you know, a bit of a rush. Almost immediately after it was posted, the listing spread all over the internet. Mostly due to the fact that so many people found it to be completely ridiculous, but there were some people who were taking it seriously. There were some people who responded as though they could feel the haunting through the internet. There were those who claimed that they could feel at unease just by looking at it, and some people even said that the picture made them sick. The listing began to receive several thousand views, and it received a number of questions which were answered in the following update that week. The size of the painting is 24 by 36 inches, so it is rather large. As I have had several questions, hear the following answers. There was no odor left behind in the room. There were no voices or the smell of gunpowder no food prints, or strange fluids on the wall. To deter questions in this direction, there are no ghosts in this world, no supernatural powers, this is just a painting. And most of these things have an explanation. In this case, probably a fluke light effect. I encourage you to bid on the artwork, and consider the last two photographs as pure entertainment. And please do not take them into consideration when bidding. As we think it is a good idea to bless any house, we still welcome input into that procedure. So at this point, it's pretty clear that the seller really didn't expect it to go that far and had gotten a bit out of hand. They were obviously backing away from the haunting narrative and even went so far as to debunk their own stakeout. And the line about considering it pure entertainment is the go-to cover-your-ass statement when selling haunted things on eBay even to this day. Because the thing is, on eBay, you could get banned for selling intangible items like, you know, ghosts or souls or things like that. As the auction drew to a close, the seller posted one final update. The auction is nearing the end. I want to thank the more than 13,000 people that took the time to look at this image on eBay. I appreciate the more than 30 suggestions that I received regarding blessing the house, exercising, and cleansing. Seven emails reported strange or irregular events taking place when viewing this image, and I will relate two suggestions made by the senders. First, not to use this image as the background on the screen, and second, not to display this image around juveniles or children. Last, not least, thanks for appreciating the art as well. And on February 12th, 10 days after the auction began, it had accumulated 30 bids, and it sold. The price of, are you ready for this? $1,025. It was purchased by a user named Ionia7. Shortly after receiving the painting, Ionia7 was interviewed by a website called SurfingTheApocalypse.com. Most of this interview revolved around why they would buy such a painting and if anything happened after they received it. What attracted you to the haunted painting? Were you interested in the piece more for its artistic value or for the legend that went with it? Visually, it seemed like a good composition. The artist displayed a certain professional handling of the medium, and the subject matter was compelling. The legend seemed like a good marketing ploy, but I was buying it to sell. How long have you had the painting? Since March 7th. Has anything unusual happened with the painting? If so, describe. I wish I could report a bizarre happening or mind possession type of thing, but the unusual things started happening with the first email and counting. Prayers and quotes from the scriptures from a man of faith, 
advice as to how to cleanse my residents of this evil thing from a Native American shaman in Mississippi, reports of people being repulsed, made physically ill, or suffering from a blackout slash mind control experiences. I've been informed that over 34,000 people on eBay alone have viewed this item. People want to know how can I live with this sort of thing, or want to buy a life-size reproduction. If anything, this is the real story. I had never received an email before that wasn't from some online porn site, and the only apparent reason I get these is because I fit the profile. Perhaps most importantly though, it was through this interview that the internet learned the name of the painting and some more information about its origins. Have you been able to find out anything about the history of the painting? I was hoping from the detail image on eBay of the boy's face that, given the crazing of the pigment, the painting would date from the 1920s or 30s. That generally would make an economic difference. It probably was completed in 1965 to 75. It is titled, The Hands Resist Him, which I think is a very interesting name. It is signed, but I'm not releasing that information yet. A good example of surrealism from that period. Just call me a lucky bidder on eBay. The painter was later revealed to be an artist named Bill Stoneham. Bill Stoneham hadn't thought much about that painting until the year 2000 when Ionia 7 contacted him to find out more. Once he learned about his work's sudden internet fame, he took to the internet to share more information about the painting. According to Bill, it was painted in 1972 and inspired by a poem that his wife wrote, also entitled The Hands Resist Him. He is of the seeing visions. His strokes reveal them. In a rush of color, of madness, of mystics and his head is the highest center. It must confront its enemy. The hands resist him, like the secret of his birth. His presence is the sanctum heartbeat, felt in darkness and in passion. Its sound, the sole gift to that silence. Bill said that the boy in the painting was based off a picture of him as a child. The hands reaching out from behind the door were intended to represent the alternate lives lived while dreaming. And the eyeless doll was intended to be the boy's guide through the various dream worlds, a very different narrative from the one presented by the original eBay listing. But that's not to say that the painting wasn't without its own set of mysterious circumstances. Both the owner of the gallery where Hands was displayed and the Los Angeles Times art critic who reviewed my show were dead within a year of the show. I'm sure it was coincidence, but some of what I paint resonates in other people, opening the inner door. The first purchaser of the painting was a character actor named John Marley, who you might remember as the guy from the horse head scene in The Godfather. And while he's often mentioned as one of the deaths associated with this painting, it should be noted that he didn't die until 1984, over a decade after the painting was purchased, and most likely after it had already left his possession. And as it turned out, the lucky eBay bidder Ionia7 turned out to be the owner of Perception Gallery in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Kim Smith. Although he had originally bought the painting to sell at a higher price, he had received a number of offers over the years and turned them all down, even some as high as six figures. Considering that he had only spent about $1,000 on it, that would have been a massive profit, so I guess at the end he just couldn't bring himself to part with it. To this day, it is still in storage at his gallery, only occasionally being displayed for special events, such as one that he held on Halloween of 2013 that was covered by Juxtapose magazine. And people's interest in the painting still continues. According to Bill Stoneham, he still receives several emails about it every single week. He's even been commissioned to create several sequels to the painting. A piece in 2004 entitled Resistance at the Threshold, in which the boy has now grown up into an old man and the doll began to transform. A piece in 2012 entitled Threshold of Revelation, which depicts the doll fully transformed into a real girl. And a prequel in 2017 entitled The Hands Invent Him, which shows us the view from behind the door in the original painting. In an interview with The Daily Dot, Bill Stoneham was asked why he thinks that so many people are still interested in this old, allegedly haunted painting, to which he responded, We live in an age of science, of revelation, and hard realities and hard facts, but we are still drawn to the mysterious, Stoneham said. And what is more mysterious than paintings? More than any other object, paintings are a one-of-a-kind thing created by someone using their hands. And for now, that's the story of The Hands Resist Him. 
On August 27th of 1968, Richard L. Chartrand, the owner of Barney's Casino in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, stepped into his Cadillac. Before he could get out of his driveway, the car was blown up by an explosive device planted underneath his floorboard. Although there were many suspects in the case, none were convicted. This case would go on to be one of Lake Tahoe's most notorious unsolved mysteries. In August of 2011, nearly 43 years later to the date, the secret to cracking this long unsolved case might have fallen into the hands of a Redditor named Jordan Laub. Seen dancing here. After his father purchased the old Barney's Casino, which by then was known as Bill's Casino, a large safe was found behind a fake wall. Someone clearly went to great lengths to conceal this thing, and considering the casino's shadowy past, people's imaginations went wild with what could be in there. And after enlisting some help from Reddit, Jordan promised answers. But, like so many of these kinds of stories on Reddit, this one became as much about treachery as it did mystery. So what did happen with Jordan's mystery safe? Let's find out! Reddit has had a lot of mysterious artifacts pop up over the years. Sometimes it can be like Legends of the Hidden Temple, but in website form. And although a lot of times people tell me that I should cover the mystery safe from Reddit, the thing is, there's a lot of mystery safes. And today I'm going to talk about the very first one, which was the mystery safe brought in by Jordan Laub under the username Secret Safe. If we go to Jordan's original post on Reddit, which he updated many times over the years, we'll see that it's now been deleted. That doesn't bode well. And if I had to guess why it was deleted, well, the thing about Reddit is... Reddit has a way of turning on people if things don't go well, and the story... things did not go well. Thankfully, a lot of the original text from this post has been salvaged across a number of different websites. The first of which can be found on an old casino message board. My name is Jordan Laub, and my dad purchased Bill's Casino, which is located in between Mont Blue and Harris Casino in South Lake Tahoe. We have found a safe behind a fake wall in the casino. The original owner of the casino was killed in 1986 in a car bomb explosion said to be conducted by the New York Mafia over a debt he never repaid. Note that Jordan has the wrong date in his post. The contents of the safe, or who owned it, are a mystery, but we believe that whatever is in the safe holds great value because anyone who would build a wall around it was really trying to protect it. Here is a link to the front page of the Tahoe Daily Tribune which features both the death article and the safe. Stay tuned for the update. And this next part is really important to how the whole thing falls apart. Reddit will be the first to know what, if anything, is in the safe. I will be there with my camera taking both video and photos of the opening before the newspaper gets to it. Now how did they come to find this safe hidden behind a fake wall anyway? Here's an interview with Jordan's father, Mike, explaining how they came to find the secret safe. You know, we demoed the whole building and then as we were working our ways up to the higher floors and the second floor is when we... There was a protrusion, uh, that, the best way to describe it, it was just a squared off uh, while I couldn't understand why it was there, I asked my architects, engineers, and their indication was that they thought it was going to be a, a part of a stair system. Uh, but as the workers pulled it back, it was actually a safe behind the wall. And what adds even more intrigue to this story about the secret safe is that it might have actually been easier to simply remove it from the casino than to build a wall around it. Once again, Mike explains. The, what, what's interesting about it is that the safe is about eight feet from an elevator. So they could have moved it. Yeah, easily. I mean, just get a furniture dolly, slide it down, and, and I mean, the trouble, to drywall a wall, you have to frame it, you have to put the drywall up, you have to tape, you have to texture, you have to let it dry, then you put the paint on. It's a several day process, whereas a, a dolly could get it out in a matter of an hour or two. Well, this would tell me the fact that they opted to hide it rather than take it away. I would think that that would mean that it's something not so much valuable, but rather something that they didn't want to be found. And considering the circumstances of this story, uh... And now continuing on with Jordan's original post, after people asked, he provided some pictures to prove that he does have access to the safe. Here he is posing with the safe and some of his friends. He also stated how he intended to open the safe. I am going to bed now. It is four in the morning, good night. I will open the safe when we get the blowtorch. I will ask my dad tomorrow morning exactly when that will be. No, I am not worried about the Mafia. 
and wisely there are Redditors who have eyes against the Blowtorch. You see, the thing about the Blowtorch is it might get the safe open, but it'll also destroy anything else that burns more easily than metal, which is most things. And you know, there's also the remote chance that there's explosives inside of the safe, and then he would ironically go out like the safe's original owner. And despite warnings, uh, it seemed like Jordan was really, really insistent about using that blowtorch. But he also promised that he was going to livestream the whole thing, which made people very happy. Hey Reddit, good news! It's being open Tuesday, 1 o'clock PST. It will be streamed via Google Plus Hangout, the 10 person video conferencing system. The stream will be available for thousands to watch free of charge and without having to be Google Plus members. I will post that link soon. People were a little bit distrustful of his promise that he would deliver because, as we all know from Reddit, OP never delivers. But Jordan insisted. Reddit first, news second. Words that he would come to eat. You know how I said that Reddit turns on people when things don't go well? For Jordan, that moment would soon come in the form of his next update. This one salvaged by Nick Engstrom on Google Plus of all places. Edit 9 2011 For anyone still following this, my dad has signed the rights to exclusive safe opening to Oprah for no monetary benefit or any other gain. I do not come back to Reddit in high esteem. I am sorry. I will not even be at the O Network opening. No one but my dad will be. Please understand my frustration with this. I am sorry. Oprah. They sold out the safe to Oprah. Rich ass Oprah for apparently no money. And that's when Reddit turned on Jordan because you see people were looking forward to a live stream that coming week. Instant gratification, which was suddenly taken off the table and now they had to wait for Oprah. And it got even worse because Jordan informed people that Oprah's episode wouldn't air until January of 2012. This was September of 2011. People can't wait that long. And eventually, to add more fuel to the fire, Jordan turned around and said that, you know what? He was gonna get in there somehow and snipe Oprah's stream of the safe opening for Reddit. Another delay. This is where you start losing followers and upvotes. Then again, if you've got Oprah, who needs Reddit? Don't forget the little people that got you here, frowny face. That is exactly what I told me dad. I'll make sure I open this safe live. I DC what Oprah says. Now, if you know anything about this sort of thing and how television works, you know that he can't just go in there and uh, hijack Oprah's stream. There's NDAs and all kinds of stuff to sign, and if Jordan tried this, he would wind up in Oprah jail. Most people on Reddit were smart enough to know this, and the pitchforks were officially out. A decree. By virtue of being a completely average Redditor, I hereby proclaim the following decree. For the crimes against Reddit, including but not limited to blatant lying, stringing along, selling out to TV networks, and abusing Reddit upvotes in a scheme to get famous on online internet news articles and a free locksmith, I do humbly yet strongly suggest this man be downvoted into oblivion, downvote the original post, downvote other related comments made by the user regarding the original post, and downvote his children's posts who are yet to be born. Register on Reddit and make their own posts. I call upon the masses who I have no right to control or request actions upon to especially downvote the original post regarding this heinous mountain of lies into the netherworld where it will no longer be read or even visible to casual readers, thereby reducing the interest of Oprah and outside media entities, the purpose of which is to bring the power and attention of this safe opening back into the hands of Reddit or in no hands at all. Upvotes giveth, and downvotes taketh away. <laughs> so at this point, it was safe to say that Jordan Laub was officially persona non grata on Reddit. He would pop in on the account from time to time, make a post, and as we can see here, anything he would ever say for any reason would just be downvoted immediately. And then it got even worse, because January came and went, and Oprah never showed the safe opening. We know that the safe had been opened because one of Jordan's updates said that it was. Edit, the O Network has opened the safe, and I have no idea what is in it. The way my dad is acting, it could be something big. 
Well, whatever thing was in there, which might have been something big, Oprah just decided to not tell us. Oprah was keeping from Reddit the thing that Reddit decided was rightfully theirs. And people were pretty mad. Yeah, I found this out the other day. I hope that guy dies in a fire. I hope he dies in a fire inside a safe I'm not allowed to know about. And the fact that Oprah would go through the trouble of setting up the safe opening, you know, getting together a crew to make a show out of it and whatnot, and then just didn't use it, that raised a lot of people's suspicions. Considering the background of the safe, a lot of people thought, well, maybe there was a reason why she didn't show it. Maybe she couldn't show it. Maybe there really were some kind of mob secrets inside of the safe, or something tying it to Richard Chartrand's death. Well, according to Sergeant Jim Halsey of the South Lake Tahoe Police Department, Nothing of substance for us inside, and the contents are being kept a secret until the Oprah Winfrey show airs in a month or so. So we know that there was nothing too spicy in there, and according to the sergeant, the show would air in a month or so. But that month went by, and then years, and for all we knew, Oprah was just keeping those juicy secrets all for herself. You know, maybe we would just not have any idea what was in there. But there was a pretty interesting video produced this time by Jack Durst of the Fabulous Lake Tahoe YouTube channel. I personally have scooped Oprah Winfrey. In this video, Jack brings on his friend Dale, who claims to have been the last person to have access to that safe. Just to satisfy everybody's curiosity, I do believe I was the last person in that safe when Mrs. Chartrand was getting ready to sell the casino. She had me and the security guard go back to the safe where she opened it and what she stored in there was a bunch of big bags of casino chips, obsolete casino chips. And myself and the security guard removed them from the safe, put them into a cart and took them out and loaded them on my bus where I drove them out to Mrs. Chartrand's and put them in her garage. And when the new owners took over, they weren't going to try to move this big huge safe, so they just walled it off. Thank you, Dale. Excellent. And if Dale did clean out this safe, he might have missed something. You see, Jordan disappeared from Reddit a long time after this all blew up in his face, but he did come back a couple years ago. And when he came back, he popped in and responded to a few people with what he says Oprah found. I was the original safe. Oh, hey, it is you. So, what happened? We opened it. Thirteen pennies. <laughs> 13 pennies. Oprah opened up that safe and found 13 pennies. And Jordan responded to multiple posts that day telling all of them about Oprah's 13 pennies. So there you go, no riches, no mafia secrets, no dead bodies, just 13 crusty old pennies. I really wish I was there that day to see the look on Oprah's face, getting this whole crew assembled, you know, a big expensive production, and she opens it and boom. 13 pennies. Congratulations, Oprah. Don't spend it all in one place. You're probably familiar with Dr. Disrespect, who at this point is one of the most recognizable faces in professional gaming. Known for his over-the-top, braggadocious nature, one of Dr. Disrespect's biggest claims to fame is, of course... Winner! 1993! 1994! Blockbuster video game champion in the online gaming community! You're looking at the true international video gaming superstar! And because the character is so over the top, you might be surprised to hear that the Blockbuster World Video Game Championships were actually a real thing. It was a massive event held two years in a row that I actually had the chance to participate in. So what were the rules of this event, what games were played, and who actually won? Find out in this episode of Tales from the Internet. And nobody's gonna get in my way today! You got it! Living in a world where professional gaming is a billion dollar industry and events can fill arenas and there's professional gamers who are legitimately mainstream stars. It's crazy to think that there was once a time that professional game was thought to be so absurd that it was actually a punchline in Far Side comics. It was something that I hadn't even considered until 1992 when I first came across an advertisement by Comerica advertising Quattro Adventure. The ad focused on the recommendation of this guy, Thor Ackerland, the Nintendo World Champion. I like all four games on Quattro Adventure, but my favorite is Super Robin Hood. 
Getting through the sheriff's evil castle is challenging and fun, but saving Maid Mary made it all worthwhile. Getting four adventure games on one cartridge is terrific. Every month, in every magazine, except for Nintendo Power because Comerica games were unlicensed and Nintendo wasn't happy about that, but that's a whole other tale. I continued to see Thor's face promoting Comerica products and I began to become consumed with this weird mix of jealousy and admiration. I was a great gamer. Why couldn't I be the one giving my opinion about Quattro Adventure? What did Thor Ackerland have that I didn't? I hated him, yet I wanted to be him. But unfortunately, there would not be another Nintendo World Championship. At least not until 2015. Those dreams of gaming glory were fading just as quickly as they had arrived. It wasn't until the summer of 1994 when Blockbuster Video began promoting the first World Video Game Championships that my opportunity arrived. Finally, this was the chance to follow in the footsteps of my hero, Thor Ackerland. I immediately walked over to my local Blockbuster and signed up where I got the rules booklet. Here's how it worked. For three weeks, Blockbuster stores around the country would have people compete to crown two store champions. One for Sega Genesis, and one for Super Nintendo. Week 1 was NBA Jam for both consoles. Week 2 was Sonic the Hedgehog 3 for Genesis and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters for Super NES. Week 3 was Virtual Racing for Genesis, and for Super NES, a special Blockbuster exclusive title, Clay Fighter Tournament Edition. The player for each console with the highest cumulative score across those three weeks would be crowned the store champion. The store champions would then be flown to the Fort Lauderdale Convention Center where they would compete against all of the other store champions. I did Super Nintendo. First week, killed it on NBA Jam. Second week, killed it on Ninja Turtles. Third week. Week 3 comes around, and I did not become the store champion. I can blame it on the subtle differences between regular Clay Fighter and Tournament Edition, but really, I just choked. What a disgrace. I let you down, Thor Ackerland. The Blockbuster World Video Game Championships commenced in Fort Lauderdale, Florida without me. The tournament itself was a centerpiece of what would be a much larger gaming convention. All of the store champions went head to head, and when the dust settled, Fred Doughty became the Genesis champion, and Mark Janine became the Super NES champion, winning an intense game of NBA Jam by only two points. I specifically remember reading about Mark's victory in GamePro, his name being burned into my memory because of a friend who pronounced his name Janani, and I thought Janani sounded pretty funny, so I just haven't forgotten that. And lucky for me, I would only have to wait another year for my chance to once again try to join Thor Ackerland and Mark Janane on top of the Mount Olympus of guys who are really good at video games. You've been practicing, now it's time! The Blockbuster World Video Game Championship is back as players all over the world square off in a do-or-die video game competition. Play! Sponsored by Nintendo, Acclaim, GamePro, and Fleer. Play! So get down to Blockbuster. Sign up now. Eat, sleep, play, play, play. <laughs> What else is there? This year, the rules were a little bit different. Rather than play different games each week, you'd play the same game each week. On the Genesis side, they had an exclusive cartridge that contained a version of Judge Dredd and a version of NBA Jam Tournament Edition. On the Super NES side, you had a modified version of Donkey Kong Country. Both of these cartridges are actually extremely rare, and if you can get your hands on them, they're worth thousands of dollars. Once again, I went with Super Nintendo, and I'm... Still a little salty about what happened here. You see, week one comes and goes, and I crushed everybody. And the reason why I crushed everybody that week was that I was the only one who seemed to know about the fact that you could smack the floor and make bananas appear in certain spots. But the other kids saw the banana smack, so week two comes around, they're all smacking the floor too and closing the gap. And then week three comes around, and well, I think you know how this story goes. I, I wish I had a video of the fucking tantrum I threw in that Blockbuster video that day. Whole... But it was an important life lesson, because that was the day I learned that you never show your hand until you absolutely have to. So the Blockbuster World Video Game Championships once again go on without me, this time in San Diego, California. And this time the finals were a little bit different too, because they didn't use the same games. This year the game selection included things like NBA Live 95, Kirby's Avalanche, Zoop, 
And the finals were decided with Batman Forever. I don't know if you've played Batman Forever, but it's really, really bad. <laughs> and when this one came to an end, Ricky Frazier became the Genesis Champion and Leon Kane became the Super NES Champion. And you probably noticed that among all these names of champions that I listed, I didn't say Dr. Disrespect, I didn't say Guy Beam, and that probably doesn't actually surprise you. I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe some of you are really shocked to hear that Dr. Disrespect wasn't actually the 1993 1994 blockbuster world video game champion. In fact, there was no 1993 championship. I mean, considering that he would have been around 12 years old at the time in an area that undoubtedly had a lot of blockbusters, I wouldn't be surprised if he actually competed in them and lost, and maybe some of that childhood longing for that glory inspired him to weave it into the character. But ultimately, it's just an over-the-top, goofy character that he's playing in hell. Even lying about that kind of thing kind of serves the character, right? It's nothing to really get mad over. Except, some people get really mad about this. Dr. Disrespect lied about being the 93-94 Blockbuster Games champion. Or at least, this is the conclusion I have come to personally. I challenge Reddit to find any proof or evidence that Guy Beam, aka Dr. Disrespect, is indeed the two-time, back-to-back, 1993-1994 Blockbuster Games World Champion. I have come up empty-handed every time. This is something I have always suspected, but all I ever got was shit from people for asking for any sort of proof. In light of recent events, I feel like this needs some recognition. If anyone can prove he really was the two-time, I will gladly accept that conclusion. But as of now, I believe he is not only a cheater, but also a layer who is deceiving his fans. It's supposed to be a gag. Coming out against him like this is like declaring wrestling is fake. We know. But with such controversy around the Doc's win, what actually did happen to the Blockbuster World video game champions? Most of them appear to have kept a very low profile since their wins. Except for one, and that's where this gets a little spicy. Allow me to reintroduce you to the 1994 Super Nintendo champion, Mark Janine. My friend Brandon, he told, he said there was no way I was even going to make it to, to Fort Lauderdale. And I made like a $10 bet with him, so I guess he's going to have to pay me back. No longer a soft-spoken child, Mark now goes by the name Angry Gamer. With an avatar that features that classic Game Pro magazine Francis Mao art style, Mark is extremely proud of his reign as the Blockbuster World Video Game Champion 1994, as is evidenced by his Instagram tag, Blockbuster Champ. Mark also speaks of his accomplishments on his Twitch bio. I entered the first Blockbuster Video Game Championship in 1994 when I was 14. It was the single largest video game tournament of the 20th century. Even to this day, tournaments don't come close. Over half a million players from around the world competed. It required complete mastery of a dozen games in a time when online console gaming was a pipe dream. After months of practice, I made it to the Nationals in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and managed to secure the title of World Champion SNES. As part of my winnings, I was given a tour of GamePro magazine the premier video game publication at the time. My avatar is actually a caricature that was drawn of me when I was honorary editor for a day. Over the next few years, I entered several other tournaments including Sega's Rock the Rock, which was televised on MTV coming in second place, Nintendo's Power Fest, and the Funko Land Championship. After earning my first college degree, I wrote a science fiction novel entitled Horizon's Edge, which is available on Amazon. I am currently engaged to a beautiful Russian woman, our wedding is planned for autumn. Aside from day trading and screenplay writing, I spend the remainder of my time thinking of ways to improve my channel and getting my cannabis business off the ground. And overall, he seems like a pretty chill dude. But there is one tweet that made him not so chill. It was a posting by Dr. Disrespect on May 21st of 2016 that sent Mark and the Doc on a collision course. Someone stole my 1993 Blockbuster Video Game Championship trophy, and I'm heated. Mark didn't take notice of this tweet until a year later in July, and he was pissed. Bullshit! You commented on a tweet that is over a year ago? Yeah, I just found out about this idiot. His whole character is fake, so the fact he's saying he's the champion, everyone already knows it's just part of his character. 
he's getting paid and a lot of people actually believe him. That's called acting. Actually, it's called fraud. Two-time winner, lol. You didn't win shit. Show me your trophy and I'll show you mine. Now, to a lot of outside observers, Mark probably just seems bitter and unreasonable. I mean, why get this mad at a guy who's just playing a character? But at the same time, try putting yourself in Mark's shoes. In 1994, something to the tune of half a million children competed in these blockbuster world video game championships. They're all hoping and dreaming to accomplish the thing that you actually did accomplish. A once-in-a-lifetime achievement, something that can never be taken from you, or so you think. Life goes on, you grow up, and the more adult responsibilities you have to take on, the more gaming fades in the background, but hey, you still always have that championship to your name, right? And then one day you learn that one of the most famous, one of the most profitable professional gamers in the world is claiming to do the thing that you actually did. Even as a joke, even as a gag, that's gotta sting a little. As I see it, there's one way to rectify this situation. I'm talking... Dr. Disrespect, Guy Beam, versus Mark Janine, the Angry Gamer, one-on-one, -on -one, head to head, in a game of NBA Jam. Hashtag Doc vs. Mark, make a trend worldwide. On May 12th of 2019, a day before me recording this video, a Twitter user named Moon Cult asked the question, Did Abraham Lincoln invent pancakes? Attached was an image showing that this question was actually Google's suggestion when he was typing in the words, Did Abraham Lincoln? Oh yeah, and all the way at the bottom of the suggestions is also, Did Abraham Lincoln die? I wonder. What did he actually want to know that Abraham Lincoln did? Uh, who knows who cares? Okay, so I spoke to Mooncult since recording the video, and apparently he was looking up something to do about the time Donald Trump had the Big Macs, in front of the portrait of Abraham Lincoln. Wow. Because this is a much more fascinating question. But there's a problem, you see, when you actually do do this search, Google gives you absolutely no information about whether or not Abraham Lincoln did invent pancakes. The top results all refer to a somewhat recently discovered patent held by Abraham Lincoln. Number 6,469, patent for buoying vessels over shoals. Patent model of Abraham Lincoln's invention at the Smithsonian Institution. Abraham Lincoln's patent relates to an invention to lift boats over shoals and obstructions in a river. It is the only United States patent ever registered to a president of the United States. Lincoln conceived the idea of inventing a mechanism that would lift a boat over shoals and obstructions when on two different occasions, the boat on which he traveled got hung up on obstructions. The original documentation of this patent was rediscovered in 1997. So clearly this invention has absolutely nothing to do with pancakes. Further down on the results, we find an educational website called Abraham Lincoln's Classroom that shows an old political comic about him. This cartoon features Abraham Lincoln encouraging Secretary of State Simon Chase to increase pancake production, which represents the national debt. Because of course that would represent the national debt. Even in the 1800s, political cartoons were ridiculous. Scrolling down further led me to a recipe for Abraham Lincoln's corn cakes on HopefulHomemaker.com. Our family has a special tradition every February 12th. We eat hoe cakes, otherwise known as corn cakes. Corn cakes is probably a better term, but my children love the name hoe cakes. The name is a result of these cakes being cooked over a fire on the end of a hoe. This was one of Abraham Lincoln's favorite foods. He first ate them as a boy, and they remained his favorite breakfast food throughout his life. He often bragged that he could eat them faster than anyone could make them. He also enjoyed them for a late Sunday supper. This made me think that maybe the corn cake lead was the right lead to go down to figure this out, so I wound up finding even more recipes. I wound up finding further clarification from a website called Homemade Italian Cooking with Cara. President Abraham Lincoln and President George Washington are both documented as loving hoe cakes for breakfast. According to Donna McCreary's cookbook, Lincoln's Table, Abraham Lincoln once said that he could eat corn cakes twice as fast as two women could make them. The Mount Vernon organization confirms hoe cakes were among George Washington's favorite foods. Both presidents love them drenched in butter and syrup or sorghum. And that's all well and good, but at the end of the day, a corn cake slash hoe cake is a very different kind of cake from a pancake. 
And also the theory that Abraham Lincoln invented pancakes is very easily debunked by Wikipedia. A pancake or a hot cake, griddle cake, or flapjack is a flat cake, often thin and round, prepared from a starch-based butter that may contain eggs, milk, and butter, and cooked on a hot surface such as a griddle or frying pan, often frying with oil or butter. Archaeological evidence suggests that pancakes are probably the earliest and most widespread cereal food eaten in prehistoric societies, and apparently they had been found in the belly of a frozen caveman named Otzi. So no, unless Abraham Lincoln is a time traveler, he definitely didn't invent pancakes. So where did this string of text even come from? By the time I had seen Moon Cult's original tweet, 12 hours had passed, and when I tried to do the search, I didn't even have to type Abraham Lincoln's full name. All I had to type was did AB, and it filled it in for me. And it's not as if Moon Cult's tweet went viral to the extent that it would actually affect the Google algorithm. At the time of me recording this video, he only had 5 retweets on his post, and my quote tweet of it had 15 retweets. Definitely not enough to make any kind of effect on Google's processes. But the few people who did try it did get the same results. Note that this only happens on Google and not DuckDuckGo. And there has to be a reason for this search happening. Google just doesn't invent these things out of whole cloth. According to Google, this is how it works. You'll notice we call these autocomplete predictions rather than suggestions, and there's a good reason for that. Autocomplete is designed to help people complete a search they are intending to do, not to suggest new types of searches to be performed. These are our best predictions of the query you are likely to continue entering. How do we determine these predictions? We look at the real searches that happen on Google and show common and trending ones relevant to the characters that are entered, and also related to your location and previous searches. So it makes search predictions based on things that people are already searching for. And that can mean one of a few different things. Perhaps Moon Cult's original tweet and the small amount of people who did copy his search were enough to affect Google's algorithm. I think it's very unlikely, but it's possible if there's that few people looking for facts about Abraham Lincoln, or Abba, or Abdullah the Butcher. Or what if there's a top secret Discord server where they meet up and they try to get phrases like this trending and into the Google search predictions? It's possible that Google search predictions could be gamed in this way, but I feel like at this point they're likely to have some kind of protection against it. If not, and such a server does exist, I have a feeling that people who watch this channel are probably in it, so let me know. Not that it'll be helpful, because now I'm sure you're all gonna tell me you're in the secret pancake server. But I think there's very likely to be some kind of an organic component to this. If you look at Google's trends, some interest in the topic has always existed. But for some reason, on April 6th of 2019, this search received a major spike in interest for reasons that I cannot determine. Maybe a reference was made to it on a show or a forum or something, but I feel like if that were the case, searching the phrase would bring us to the source. A Twitter user Stanco suggested that it might be something like that old I accidentally build a shelf meme. That was one that baffled a lot of people and ultimately wound up being traced back to a Yahoo Answers question. Help. I accidentally build a shelf? I was trying to build something else, but I ended up with a shelf. How do I fix this? I totally know what you're saying. The other day, I was going to make myself a sandwich. Next thing I know, I have a big old shelf on my plate. Good thing I stopped and looked down before taking a bite. I still have the slivers from last time I that happened. The best thing to do is just play it cool. Act like you actually meant to build a shelf. Consider giving it away as a gift to someone you don't really like. I can tell if someone is mad at me because they send me a shelf for my birthday. It's so passive aggressive. Another option is to make the shelf into a bench for vertically challenged people. I would use another word that we all know, but people in this day and age consider that term a slur. But it is very easy to put a ladder next to the shelf and add some pillows and magazines. Then, the next time a midget friend comes by for a visit, show him slash her how much you care for their comfort. On some level, this seems like a very clear attempt to recapture the magic of how is Babby formed, 
but screenshots of this question catch on regardless, causing people to look up the question. And then because of people looking up the question that they saw in a screenshot, Google puts it into their predictions algorithm. Then people who have no idea about the Yahoo Answers question see it in their predictions and they're like, what the hell's going on here? It's a loop that just winds up reinforcing itself over and over again. But once again, if that were the case, then tracing it back to its source shouldn't be a problem. But there are a few tiny threads that we can try to follow to a source. I found that by playing around with the way that I type in the question, Google offers a few more suggestions. The most interesting of which to me was, did Abraham Lincoln created pancakes? And it's when I clicked on that version of the search prediction that I finally found the first reference to Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes. TheBroShow.com, November 2nd, 2010, written by Greg Bro. Abraham Lincoln facts, written very much in the style of Chuck Norris facts. These facts include things like, Abe Lincoln knit, then wore, the first pair of Zubaz in 1825. Abe Lincoln once built an entire cabin out of empty scotch bottles. Abe Lincoln considered creating his own political party called Uncle Abe's House Party, but then decided to invent pancakes instead. And there it is, the earliest mention of Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes that I could find. But it doesn't strike me as the kind of article that went viral and certainly didn't leave enough of a cultural footprint that it's suddenly blowing up on April 6th of 2019. But what pushed me further up the thread was searching for Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes on Twitter. When we look for it on Twitter, we'll find that the earliest mention of it was in 2011, a year after Greg's article was published, posted by an account named Abraham Lincoln Facts. This account only posts jokes that are very much in the style of Greg's multiple Abraham Lincoln articles. Conspiracy time! Could it be that Greg Bro just loved his Abraham Lincoln pancake joke so much that he coordinated with a group of people in a secret Discord server just to get the joke into Google's search predictions algorithm? Alright, I think that's a little bit of a reach, because it seems like Greg has, by and large, moved on from this. If you look at the profiles attached to his website, you'll see that he's currently an animator with a number of projects going on, including a TV show called Neighborhood Superwatch that's on DreamWorks TV. It just seems kind of off to me that someone who clearly has, like, a bunch of real-life stuff going on would put this much work into making an old joke sneak into an algorithm that most people would never in a million years notice. But you know, you can't rule them out 100%. But more evidence against that theory is that if we look into Google Trends, we'll see that there is still a little bit of interest before 2010, and there's a second peak in 2004 right at the beginning of Google Trends. Could it be that the story of Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes is just some kind of lost old joke or cultural reference that most people have forgotten about. Could this be like some kind of Mandela effect adjacent phenomenon? If I'm being totally honest, I'm just stumped here at this point. I don't know why Google wants to suggest this. If you have ideas, please, you know, leave a comment about it, hit me up on the gram with it, because I, I gotta know. Today I've got a little update for you regarding my Abraham Lincoln video and the Google search prediction that suggests that he in fact was the guy who invented pancakes. If you haven't seen the video already, I suggest you watch it, but if you don't feel like it, here's a quick rundown. So at the time of me making that video, typing did AB into Google search bar would lead to the prediction did Abraham Lincoln invent pancakes. If you were to go with that search, however, it would tell you nothing about whether or not Abraham Lincoln invented pancakes. All you would get was information on a sailing-related patent that he owned. Nothing else could be found on the topic except for some recipes, an old blog post by a cartoonist, and an old joke Twitter account. And none of this explained any of the spikes related to the search on Google Trends on either April 6th of 2019 or all the way back in 2004. 
And that's where I left the video off, but thanks to you, I have some answers. Let's start with looking at why the search for did Abraham Lincoln invent pancakes spiked in April of 2019. And I believe that we can definitively answer this one. After my video came out, a number of you reached out to me in both the comments section and on Instagram to tell me about a Netflix show called Santa Clarita Diet. The second episode of the third season contains a line referring to the Abraham Lincoln pancake myth. People can be more than one thing. Abraham Lincoln invented the pancake. And this show was released on March 29th, a week before the April 6th spike on Google Trends. Considering the timing, I think this is absolutely 100% the reason why this started to be suggested in Google's prediction algorithm. But that still doesn't explain the 2004 spike or where this idea came from in the first place. And a lot of you reached out to me with a few different theories on where it came from, one of them being brought up by Matthew Mises on Instagram. The first one back when I was in kindergarten in 2004. I remember vaguely about a book that was sold at my school's scholastic fair that talked about it. I don't remember the specific name of it, but it was a picture book that talked about Lincoln eating a lot of pancakes, so maybe something is there, IDK. As far as I've seen, he's the only one that's brought up a book, but if any of you guys saw that book, let me know about it. Chris Brugman's presented another idea. It probably has something to do with the term Lincoln stack for pancakes. That could get confused people to Google, did Lincoln invent pancakes? Personally, I've never heard the term Lincoln stack and I couldn't really find anything about it. But once again, if you're familiar with this term, let me know. Asuka Tano Gaming presented a different idea, this time about a lost website. A joke was going around during really late 2003 and really, really early 2004, and the website was deleted a few days slash weeks later, and most people don't know about it, but it was big enough for a spike during that time, and I have looked back on an old computer that I had got during mid-2003, and I saw that the question was on it, and a website domain that just didn't make sense, then an electrical power outage happened and it bricked the computer or short-circuited it. And I did see a few other people suggest that it was part of an April Fool's joke on a website. And finally, another theory that a lot of you brought up, and what I think seems to be the most likely case for an origin story for this myth, is Log Cabin Pancake Syrup. A look at their website shows that the brand is very much inspired by Abraham Lincoln. About Log Cabin. Log Cabin has been making delicious syrup for 120 years. Minnesota grocer Patrick J. Towell introduced the brand in 1887 and named it in honor of his childhood hero and true American icon, President Abraham Lincoln. President Lincoln grew up in a log cabin deep in the woods of Kentucky, hence the brand name Log Cabin, chosen by Mr. Towell to honor Abraham Lincoln. Toy Insanity took it a step farther by saying that the myth about Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes was inscribed on an old log cabin bottle. If you had log cabin syrup in the late 1980s, it said this fact about Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes or hotcakes under the lid of the syrup bottle. As I think about it, it was not under the lid, it was on the back of the label on the front. So in effect, it looked like it was printed inside the bottle. The thing was, you had to use up the dark colored log cabin syrup to read the fact. I think it was a ploy to get people to use the syrup faster so they could read the hidden facts inside the bottle. And I was unable to find this specific version of the bottle, only an old collectible tin that seems to be a popular item on eBay. But if you've seen this bottle with the myth on the label or even have one, let me know about it. Anyway, if you have any other theories about where this idea of Abraham Lincoln inventing pancakes actually came from, let me know in the comments. Oh, that's